education. And today he will give us a talk on syndromic primary hyperparathyroidism, when to test and what to test for. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I'm very grateful to um, Fausto and Kareem for the kind invitation. They've asked me to talk about syndromic primary hyperparathyroidism, when to test and what to test for. So I'll cover some history and epidemiology, and then I'll really focus on the syndromic uh, forms of hyperparathyroidism, which is the title of today's talk. I will go through the various clues for these uh, syndromic heritable forms, the benefits and pitfalls of screening, some screening and surveillance guidelines. I'll propose a clinical assessment pathway and also uh, look to the future. So the parathyroid glands uh, were first discovered in which animal? Um, the giraffe, the penguin, the Tyrannosaurus rex, the rhinoceros, uh, or the pelican? Okay, so it's either the rhinoceros or the giraffe. Maybe the rhinoceros. Okay, let's see. Okay, so in 1834, London Zoo purchased a male Indian rhinoceros. And this was at the request of Richard Owen, who was an anatomist. And so his dissection um, of the rhinoceros's uh, neck after it died from traumatic injuries, actually, um, uh, was the first to identify the parathyroid glands. And you can see this tub in the Museum of the Royal College of Physicians. So, um, Eva Sandstrom uh, actually formally named the glands, however. He was a medical student um, in Sweden. So naming a whole new gland is quite impressive um, for a medical student. And so I think we have some medical students in the audience to so take note. So um, he identified the parathyroid glands in land vertebrates from man uh, through to rabbits. And just an interesting fact, it appears that aquatic vertebrates don't have parathyroid glands. And that's thought to be due to the plentiful and continuous supply of calcium in seawater. So in our bodies, we have about a kilo of calcium and 99% of that is in the skeleton. There are lots of important processes that calcium is involved in and calcium homeostasis is tightly regulated by the parathyroids, which are perhaps the master gland through their secretion of PTH, which acts on the gut, the kidneys and the bone to regulate calcium very tightly. So what happens when things go wrong? Well, you can have hyperparathyroidism. And that's typified by hypercalcemia, which is most frequently actually asymptomatic, coupled with a raised and inappropriately normal uh, parathyroid hormone level. The prevalence and incidence is probably increasing. And it's important to note that the prevalence and incidence are probably a few times higher in women. And this is thought to be due to the estrogen drop at the menopause, because estrogen is actually protective against parathyroid tumor formation and also bone resorptive effects. Here's a normal uh, parathyroid gland, a few millimeters uh, across, and you can compare this to this parathyroid adenoma, and below here, hyperplasia. Now, don't forget, uh, you get these oxophilic cells, and these are the cells that are rich in mitochondria, and so avidly take up and retain the technetium sestamibi in our sestamibi uh, scans. So, <clears throat> primary hyperthyroid hyperparathyroidism can be divided into sporadic, and heritable forms, the heritable will make up a large chunk, 10 to 15%. So starting with the sporadic, here these are characterized by absent family history of parathyroid tumors. We've of course got the adenomas, we've got the carcinomas, which are probably increasing uh, in incidence, typically quite indolent, but do recur very frequently. Parathyromatosis, which is uh, due to multiple ectopic foci of parathyroid tissue in the neck and mediastinum, often as an embryological remnant or from seeding from parathyroid surgery. Then you've got um, calcium sensing receptor blocking antibodies in autoimmune hypercalcemia, rare disease. And about 25% of people on lithium will at some point develop hypercalcemia. So moving on to the heritable causes, we've got syndromic and the non-syndromic forms. And so these syndromic forms are associated with a set of extra parathyroidal features. So they are a syndrome. We have MEN1 through to five, no MEN3. You never get primary hyperparathyroidism in MEN3. Um, and then you've got the jaw tumor syndrome at the end. And then there's the non-syndromic forms, the three types of FHH, followed by familial isolated hyperparathyroidism and neonatal severe hyperparathyroidism. 
MEN1 is probably going to be the most common that you will see. So I'm sure you'll agree the aim of genetic testing is to improve health outcomes. And how can we do this? Well, early genetic testing is important for planning the surgical extent, of course. You'll have different uh, approaches to these three syndromes. And for surveillance for recurrence and other extra parathyroidal features, and also for cascade screening and for family planning, which may include preconception, pre-implantation, and prenatal genetic testing. However, there are pitfalls. For example, you may get false negative genetics. So in some cases, the genotype, the genotype may not match uh, with your phenotype, and you should discuss this uh, with a geneticist because they may need to do other genetic tests. There may be incomplete penetrance in the disorder, occult primary hyperparathyroidism in some families, de novo mutations, so this is where there's no family history. You can get variants of unknown significance, um, and these should be classified as uh, one to five by the American College of Medical Genetics, and their misclassification can obviously cause harm. So if a uh, benign a variant is misclassified as pathogenic, and obviously these patients can present to different specialities who may have less expertise in MEN. So we've got MEN1, 2, no 3, and then 4, um, 5, and the jaw tumor syndrome. So let's start with MEN1. So this was first identified by Paul Wormer in 1954, who published a case series and defined its autosom autosomal dominant mode of inheritance. It's a loss of function uh, in the MEN1 gene coding for the men in uh, tumor suppressor gene. And uh, interestingly, it seems that Harvey Cushing, about 20 years earlier, may have had a patient actually with MEN1, uh, but he ended up just stuck with Cushing's uh, syndrome. So then um, it obviously makes up a large percentage of primary hyperparathyroidism, depending on the series. There are clues to screen when you've got that patient with primary hyperparathyroidism uh, in, in front of you in clinic. So the primary hyperparathyroidism will, um, pr will be present in 100% by the age of 50. It's the most penetrant and often the first manifestation in the majority. And I think the youngest published case is in a four-year-old. Now, compared to sporadic, it's earlier in onset, it's multi-gland, higher risk of recurrence, and there's this greater reduction in bone mineral density due to the longer duration of raised parathyroid hormone. There are specific benefits from a parathyroid point of view to identifying MEN1. Um, there's obviously a lesser requirement for pre-op localization, as most frequently a bilateral exploration uh, will be performed. Genetics will help guide your timing and extent of surgery, uh, resulting in less uh, recurrence. And thymectomy will often be performed at the same time to minimize this risk of mediastinal recurrence due to parathyroid tissue uh, in the thymus and also thymic carcinoid. Now, for the students, carcinoid basically means microscopically looks like a carcinoma, but behaves in a, uh, in a, in a benign uh, manner. Okay, so what about clues based on other manifestations? Obviously, you can have pituitary adenomas as a presenting um, a manifestation. Compared to sporadic, these are typically earlier, multiple recur macros, uh, although the recent literature suggests they may not be this greater um, uh, number of macros. Plurihormonal um, and invasive, the most common are obviously the prolactinomas and the non-functioning, but ultimately the management is similar uh, to sporadic pituitary uh, adenomas. Now for the gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, interestingly, 16 to 36% of all gastronomas occur in MEN1. So if you see a patient with a gastronoma in clinic, you really must be sending genetics uh, for MEN1. In terms of insulinomas, the figure is 4%. And compared to sporadic, they're earlier, multiple, recur, they're more aggressive, and the main cause of uh, morbidity and mortality. You can get adrenal nodules, skin lesions, and obviously the benefits for a genetic diagnosis from a non-parathyroid point of view is that surveillance will allow you to detect things earlier and treat before metastases, especially for these non-functioning pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, which are the highest cause of mortality in MEN1. Now, interestingly, parathyroid surgery can ameliorate uh, hypergastronemia symptoms in 20% of patients, and that's because uh, calcium can actually stimulate um, antral and duodenal uh, mucosa because there's calcium sensing receptor uh, on these cells. So in terms of genetic testing, uh, you may find de novo mutations, so no family history and up to 10%. 
Uh, typically, you can identify the mutation in up to 90%, but most, but not all, of MEN1. I think we know about 600 mutations so far. There is no clear genotype-phenotype correlation, unlike in MEN2, which we'll move on to uh, shortly. Now, I, I won't go through surveillance in much detail. There are guidelines. This is basically due to the fact that 40% will develop a tumor by the age of 40 years. And let's not forget the burden of surveillance. So by the age of 50, a carrier will typically have about 200 blood tests and 70 scans. So therefore, it's important not only to identify carriers, but also identify non-carriers to relieve them from the anxiety and the burden of all this uh, surveillance. So Mentimeter time. A 31-year-old woman presents with marked hyperparathyroidism, a palpable neck lump and a hoarse voice. She is an orphan. Which syndromic form of hyperparathyroidism is most likely? The 2345 or jaw tumor syndrome? Okay, great. Um, not the answer I was looking for, but anyway, we will we will move on. I will tell you the answer later on. But the obvious next MEN is MEN2, so that might have led you on a bit, but let's uh, see. Okay, so MEN2. Um, so we were fortunate enough a few weeks ago to hear from Professor Sir Bruce Ponder, and Tom mentioned this earlier, who gave us a talk about the search for the MEN2 gene, which he published in Nature in 1993. He said what took him about 11 years back then would probably take him about 11 weeks with the advances in, uh, in technology these days. Very inspiring talk. So MEN2 is an autosomal dominant uh, disease due to a gain of function in the RET uh, proto-oncogene on chromosome 10. The prevalence is lower than MEN1. Si uh, dissimilar to MEN1, there are these genotype-phenotype correlations um, that both Tom and David mentioned uh, this morning. So, for example, you can see this code on 634 mutations, highly um, uh, suggestive of developing uh, hy uh, hyperparathyroidism. And then you've got the 918, it's got high risk of, is the highest risk of MTCs. Okay, so you don't get this sort of uh, genotype, phenotype correlation in the other MENs. So in terms of the parathyroid tumors, these are actually the third commonest uh, manifestation. The penetrance is 30%, but very rarely does it present with primary hyperparathyroidism. The clues to screen are these young patients. It's typically a mild single gland disease, and code 634 mutations are most associated with development of parathyroid tumors. Uh, medullary thyroid cancers, obviously 100% penetrant, and the reason why thyroidectomies are performed and we talked about the pheochromocytomas uh, this morning, often uh, bilateral. You can get skin signs as well and Hirschsprung's disease. And obviously the benefits of screening in primary hyperparathyroidism, it will guide surgery. Typically you'll perform bilateral exploration, but you'll typically resect only the enlarged glands, unlike in MEN1, where you may go for a subtotal uh, parathyroidectomy. And obviously the mutation will help guide you um, regarding the timing of surgery for your medullary thyroid cancer, or you may perform it at the time of parathyroid surgery. There are surveillance guidelines with annual blood tests for the three manifestations available. Now, moving on to MEN4. So uh, this is an autosomal dominant disorder um, caused uh, due to loss of function in the cyclin-dependent kinase uh, gene uh, 1B uh, on chromosome 12. So you've got, you can see here, it's got very similar manifestations to MEN1, but you have negative MEN1 gene testing. So actually probably 3% of these with this negative MEN1 gene testing actually turn out to have MEN4. Um, very low prevalence, but fairly high prevalence, not quite the same as MEN1, but higher than MEN2. So you've got similar manifestations to MEN1, but there are important differences, typically a later and a milder disease. The benefits of screening, well, obviously it will guide surgery and also your surveillance. Generally, you'll follow MEN1 protocols. There are also mutations in these genes that have been identified recently, which may also uh, cause something similar, but typically ge genetic panels don't test for these mutations at the moment. They're amber on the um, panel uh, app uh, um, and national genomics guidelines at the moment. So moving on to MEN5, 
Um, so this was basically named um, following this uh, report of a couple of Australian families uh, by Emma Duncan's group. Uh, we've known for a while that max mutations can result in endocrine tumors. And as mentioned this morning by David, you can get pheochromocytomas, but also parathyroid adenomas have been reported. Now, interestingly, there is this possibility of ectopic calcitropic factors because some of these patients' hypercalcemias have resolved through adrenalectomy, so su suggesting an ectopic uh, source. So finally, the jaw tumor syndrome. Okay, so this was identified by Gene Jackson in 1990. He actually published on this family with just familial isolated hyperpara, and then many years later realized they all developed jaw tumors, so came up with a jaw tumor syndrome. It's autosomal dominant, it's due to loss of function mutations uh, in the CDC73 gene. The penetrance is 80%, and unlike in MEN2, there's no clear genotype-phenotype correlation, although actually missense mutations have a lower likelihood of parathyroid carcinoma. 20% with a cli uh, clinical diagnosis have no detectable mutations, so we probably need to discover some more uh, mutations for this disorder. In terms of the parathyroid tumors, these are the commonest, earliest, and sometimes the only manifestation present at a young age. The penetrance is 65% by the age of 50, as opposed to 100% for MEN1. Typically single gland, so you may suggest a unilateral approach. However, I'll come on to that in a second. Um, recurrence is high. But there is this high prevalence of atypical um, adenomas and carcinomas, up to 20%. And this sort of has tends to dominate the more, more recent guidelines on the surgical approach to these patients. <clears throat> In terms of the jaw tumors, so actually this, this disorder is um, misnamed because you can get uh, tumors in the maxilla, not just the mandible. So um, the jaw tumors are these ossifying fibromas that you can see here with this typical sclerotic uh, outer border splaying the teeth here. The penetrance is about 10 to 30%. Uh, and if you do see multiple ossifying fibromas, then it is highly suggestive of jaw tumor syndrome. Now, Bradley, who uh, wrote up quite a lot of uh, the literature um, following the discovery of this jaw tumor syndrome, basically found that 75%, I think, of the carriers, of the female carriers, had menorrhagia. And so he then uh, came up with all these uterine uh, tumors associated with this um, syndrome, um, as you can see here. So the benefits of screening, obviously, it will guide surgery. Nowadays, you the, the, there is the uh, the favor is for a bilateral exploration due to this high carcinoma risk and perhaps an on-block resection because the carcinoma may be stuck to surrounding structures such as the uh, such as the thyroid. And obviously, screening is beneficial for monitoring um, thereafter. There are surveillance guidelines, so it involves imaging um, for these. Um, the, uh, disorders, as well as a blood test for calcium and ETH. So here I've made a table really with the key parathyroid points from the uh, five disorders we've talked about so far. So MEN1 through to the jaw tumor. So they're all loss of function apart from this gain of function in the proto-oncogene, uh, the rep proto-oncogene. They're all autosomal dominant. The mutation is found in the majority, but not all patients. The only disorder currently with a nice genotype phenotype correlation, as I showed you, is this MEN2. Uh, Prevalence is greatest by far for MEN1. In terms of the penetrance, it's very high for MEN1 and MEN4, though that's a very rare uh, form of the disease. So if you see a patient in clinic who's just got primary hyperparathyroidism, that will be consistent with your MEN1s or your jaw tumor presentations. The others tend not to present with primary hyperparathyroidism. In terms of the age, you've got these younger uh, patients, apart from MEN4 and 5, and these other points are things I covered um, in the individual diseases. So quickly, I just want to go through the non-syndromic uh, forms. So these are not associated with extra parathyroidal uh, signs or symptoms. Of course, we have FHH types 1 to 3, autosomal dominant disease, and basically um, this increases the calcium PTH uh, set point. Now, it looks like we underestimated the prevalence, and recent data suggests it's probably 100 times more likely than we used to think. It's still about four or five times less common than primary hyperparathyroidism, but the prevalence looks like it's between one in 1,000 to one in uh, 5,000. There are three forms due to three different gene um, 
abnormalities with FHH1 being the most common and FHH3 being the more severe with more marked hypercalcemia, more marked hypocalciuria, um, and also you can get sort of kidney and uh, bone sequelae from it, as well as neurodevelopmental problems. Familial isolated hyperparathyroidism, this is really a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, there are genes implicated, especially activating mutations in GCM2, which probably make up about 20% of this disorder, but the most uh, unknown, probably 80%, we don't know about the genetics for um, this disorder. So a lot of future work will focus on that. Then there's neonatal severe hyperparathyroidism that typically presents around day 14 with very severe hypercalcemia. There are obviously benefits to screening. You're not gonna to touch the neck of a patient uh, who has uh, FHH. And in FIHP, if you do find the gene, that's useful for cascade and family planning. Now, one important point to stress here is that when you're differentiating between FHH and primary hyperparathyroidism, don't forget that about 10% of patients with FHH have a ratio above 0 0.01, and 10% of primary hyperparathyroid, the more common disorder, have a ratio of lower than 0 0.01. So in this day and age, we really should be focusing on a genetic diagnosis and not relying on biochemistry. So in terms of clues for heritable causes, so here I've put together all the various clues uh, that I covered from family history, early onset, multiple tumors, gastrinomas, uh, through to fears, ossifying fibromas and the like. But when you really boil it down, these are probably the key indications from the literature for genetic testing. So a young age, although there is some controversy, so less than 45 years has a 10% yield for positive genetics. Family history, so this is the strongest predictor of positive uh, genetics, so you must do if there's a family history of primary hyperparathyroidism. Multi-gland disease has a very good yield, parathyroid cancer or a typical 20% yield. Don't forget that most people would say that if your test has a 10% chance of producing a positive genetic yield, then it is worthwhile. So you could almost argue that because 10 to 15% of primary hyperparathyroidism is heritable, you could almost think that maybe you should screen almost everyone. Then you have recurrent persistent gastrinomas or another MEN1-associated tumor, family history of MEN1, MTCs, your ossifying fibromas, not just uh, in the jaw, but also in the maxilla, and um, a biochemical suspicion of family um, uh, familial uh, hypercalciuric hypercalciuria. So what actually can we do in the UK? Well, we have these testing criteria uh, recently updated uh, this summer, the National Genomic uh, Test uh, Directory. So this is panel R151, is what you would put down on your form. And I think it's quite generous. It allows you to send off genes uh, if your patient's under 50 years old with primary hyperparathyroidism, or any age with a confirmed family history, multiglandular or hyperplasia, parathyroid carcinomas, atypicals or cystics. Cystics you might get in the jaw tumor, for example. Um, ossifying fibromas of the maxilla and mandible. Now, there are also international guidelines. So John Bilzikian uh, published these uh, last year from the Fifth International Workshop, and they cover similar um, sort of indications. So if we go back to those key indications based on all the things I talked about today, how well does our national criteria uh, cover these? Well, the answer is very well. I think we, we, we've got good coverage of all the key indications uh, from the literature, International Workshop covers these top half as well. The thing that they don't cover um, is recurrent and persistent disease. And uh, this might be due to um, variations in surgical success. Um, uh, anyway, so when you send off your R151 on your genetics, it's going to test these uh, genes, basically everything in the uh, green. OK, this is too rare yet. Um, and you can see this is more information is available here. Um, and you may also be sent off by chemical testing, which often will come back far quicker than your genetic tests. So the answer to the question I had in mind was uh, jaw tumor syndrome. So this was to suggest a parathyroid uh, carcinoma um, presentation here. So in terms of a clinical assessment uh, pathway, um, when you suspect heritable primary hyperparathyroidism in a patient in front of you, so things you're looking at are the age, are there any syndromic manifestations, 
Is there a family history? Uh, what are the parathyroid uh, characteristics, the biochemistry? Then you want to make a decision on when to do, uh, whether to do the, uh, the genetics, get informed consent. Obviously, there are lots of other implications, insurance implications, et cetera, uh, in genetic testing. Then the form of genetic testing, you're going to do the full panel, R151, or if you already know what the mutation is from other family members, uh, then you may just uh, screen the single gene. And then you perform the results review. Does the genotype, does the result match the phenotype, the patient uh, in front of you? If not, then you probably would want to discuss with the geneticist. There may be other forms of genetic testing to detect other um, abnormalities, such as sort of mosaicism and things like that. And then pathogenic mutation, you're going to follow the management and surveillance guidelines for that disorder. The dreaded variants of unknown uh, significance, um, you probably in some cases want to discuss uh, with a geneticist. And don't forget to revisit your patients who've uh, come up with a variant of unknown significance, at least sort of every five years at least, uh, because sometimes they get reclassified and you won't necessarily be told about that. And if you don't get any uh, positive results, then there's a low likelihood of a monogenic disorder, but not impossible, as I've showed you before. Um, many mutations are still to be discovered, which takes me nicely on to the future. So we will be getting faster and cheaper uh, genetic results with next-gen sequencing. There are many mutations to be discovered, especially in FIHP. We still know about 80% of the mutations. The USs will be reclassified over time. We'll start using polygenic risk scores. So these are all monogenic disorders, but they may be polygenic risk scores. And finding out more about the genotype phenotype associations, which work so nicely for MEN2, but we haven't got that information yet for the other disorders. And we'll also get more data to guide the management of heritable hyperparathyroidism. So in conclusion, uh, consider the genetics in all patients uh, with primary hyperparathyroidism. We've gone through the clues today. Family history is key, but don't forget there is incomplete penetrance in some and in others, mutations have not yet been detected. And this is a rapidly evolving field. There are lots of benefits of screening, but it's obviously not without harms. And remember that burden of surveillance uh, that I showed you. And the R151 panel is good. Thumbs up for that. So thank you very much uh, for listening. And thank you to this uh, rhinoceros for his contributions. Thank you. You mentioned it's quite nice to identify people who are gene negative so that you could remove the burden of surveillance. But I'm aware that our knowledge of genetics is changing. And in the past, we've had advice to discharge people who don't need follow-up because they have insignificant disease with a genetic condition. And then later, we realized we should have kept them. Um, there are examples in, in diabetes, for example, in, in diabetes genetics. So might there be a case for keeping all of those who are siblings of MEN1 families with a normal calcium on an annual screening, just a blood test and a letter, rather than saying, I know today that you're fine and I'll change my mind in 10 years time when the genetic science has moved on? Just a thought. I, I, think, that's, I think that's very sensible. And we know it's going to be 100% penetrant by age of 50. So there's, you know, we could probably discharge them on their 50th birthday, I guess, yeah. Thanks very much. Um, I, I hope I heard correctly, but assuming, um, uh, as Kremer always sort of teaches us, if you have a patient with hypercalcemia and, and the biochemistry looks a bit like primary hyperparathyroidism, or is it FHH, go back on open net and see if you can find a normal calcium. If you can't do that, um, I think you mentioned that 10% of FHH urine studies are um, over 0.01. Um, but then I think the genetics are only 70% pickup, aren't they, for FHH? Mm -hmm. So we're kind of still stuck in a sort of quandary as to what, I suppose, do we do we suggest we do both? Because doing a urine collection is always a little bit difficult mm -hmm. for some patients. What would be your advice? Well, I think that's why the M151 panel now covers both. It automatically that does all of them because it's starting to appreciate that there is this, um, this overlap uh, between the two. There may be some cases may have this autoimmune uh, hypercalcemia syndrome because that can present very similar to FHH, but there's only a you know very very few cases that have been identified um, so far. Um, we know that FHH is ninety to one hundred percent penetrant disease from birth. So you know what you said, going on open net and getting the old calcium is really the trick because you get you you get the diagnosis nice and early.
Uh, but yeah, we're still, I, I think as we discover more and more FHHGs, talking to Fadil um, from Oxford, who's done a lot of work on the genetics, he says that, you know, new ones are being identified all the yeah. time. So hopefully, I think we're on about 80% and hopefully um, we'll, we'll get up with time. Thank you. Should we just take one last question for Mushtaq, who's on, if you want to unmute Mushtaq and ask your question. Hi, thank you for that um, excellent overview. Um, I just wanted to know about when, but the screening uh, for the fractional extrusion of calcium. Is it mandated that you have to do a 24-hour urinary calcium, uh, 24-hour urinary collection, or can you do a second void morning spot urine? Is I it think, I, yeah, that's a good question, Mushtaq. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think it's... Um, You've got to have a ratio of less than 0 0.02, um, basically, to do the um, to do the genetics. There, there is there are some studies that suggest that sort of a random is as good as a 24 hour. But I think the, most of the guidelines will sort of will try and focus on the 24 hour because of the change in um, food intake uh, over the course of 24 hours. The other difference to point out is that the 24 hour urine will be acidified. And a spot urine won't be acidified. And so you'll get a serious discrepancy if the calcium comes out of solution and your urine calcium is lower because of that, because of some precipitation. So we should always use acidified. Yeah. So that probably then means always doing 24 hour urine. Yeah. And so don't forget the it's one acid when you send off a urine for calcium creatinine, it's one acid bottle. Because normally they would do the creatinine on a non-acid bottle, but they can do it on an acid bottle, but you've got to get them to do it on the same collection. So it's what you always write in the form one acid bottle, please. This is a good point. So just to thank you so much. Thank we you. had an absolutely fantastic talk, starting with the rhino uh, larynx and <laughs> incredibly informative. So um, just to welcome now Dr. James Pittaway from BART. Um, so um, he's going to present a case of hyperparathyroidism, jaw tumor syndrome, so very relevant, parathyroid carcinoma and hungry bones. Thank you very much, James. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to share this case. Uh, my name is James Pittaway. I'm one of the endocrine registrars in the Northeast Thames region, currently working at BART. And uh, I'll share a, a history of a case of hyperparathyroidism, jaw tumor syndrome. So this is a gentleman who originally presented age 46 years old. He was uh, from Tanzania, and his only medical history at the point of presentation was that he had an ossifying fibroma, which was removed from his uh, left maxilla in 1991. And he was referred to the outpatients uh, at our hospital, um, complaining of a, a two-stone weight loss with impaired appetite, polyuria, polydipsia, muscle pain and bone pain, and initial investigations revealed that his serum calcium was above three with a PTH of above 168. He had a low vitamin D and the initial management was just to start some uh, vitamin D replacement at, as the workup was started. And at that point, unfortunately, he had a bereavement in Tanzania, went home, got lost to follow up and then didn't represent again until three years down the line, unfortunately. At this point, he had a two by four centimetre, very firm solitary nodule in the left anterior triangle of his neck. And the other uh, finding on note on examination at the time was uh, corneal calcifications on fundoscopy. These were his investigations at his representation in 2010. As you can see, he still has a, a raised correct calcium of 3.4 with a PTH, which is higher. Vitamin D is still very low. And his ALP is now over 1,000 with a degree of renal dysfunction also. Other investigations at the time showed that he had a severe bone mineral density loss, um, as shown with the DEXA scan. And an ultrasound uh, found that this mass was uh, sort of matched to 3.3 by 2.5 by 2.5 centimeters. Uh, and it looked like it was the left upper parathyroid. Uh, there was a significant extra thyroidal component. And so this was all consistent with um, yeah, being parathyroid. Here's his Sestamibi scan, where you can see in the bottom left uh, the light up there of the parathyroid gland. And this is a CT scan of the neck uh, showing the mass there. So he proceeded to surgery. In the build up to surgery, he was um, given loading with vitamin D, uh, 300,000 units IM. Uh, and his hypercalcemia in the build up was managed with intravenous fluids and sinicalcit that was up titrated to a maximum dose of 60 milligrams twice a day. At the time of surgery, he had his left upper parathyroid gland removed and also an ipsilateral lower gland removed. And at the time of surgery, it was clear that the parathyroid mass was invading the thyroid. And so he had a left 
uh, hemithyroidectomy as well. Um, there was a macroscopic residual left on the esophagus, and when the histology was reviewed, it was clear that there was invasion into the thyroid and lymphovascular invasion, uh, allowing the pathologist to, to classify this as a parathyroid carcinoma. The key 67 was between 5 and 10%, and the ipsilateral lower parathyroid gland was normal. Now, his post-surgical course was uh, complicated by severe hungry bone syndrome. And you can see this is a graph of all of his corrected calciums over a period of about three months. Um, and hopefully you can see that the dotted red lines is the uh, reference range. And after his surgery, he had to spend one month on intensive care, um, suffering from a pneumonia, but also very severe hungry bone syndrome. You could see his calcium was as low as 1.5 and, and ranging between 1.5 and 2 essentially for a month. He was having daily uh, calcium gluconate infusions and magnesium infusions and was started on some activated vitamin D and some oral calcium also. Eventually, uh, as his admission progressed, he recovered and was able to go home on two micrograms of alpha calcitol a day, uh, continued sort of um, vitamin D loading and some oral magnesium. Unfortunately, this didn't hold things very long, and he was admitted uh, shortly thereafter with a correct calcium of 1.18, uh, very symptomatic, requiring further calcium infusions and an inpatient stay before he was eventually discharged on a much larger dose of alpha calcitol with additional oral calcium. Now, because of the macroscopic residual uh, on the esophagus, the decision was made at the MDT to give him some uh, post-operative external beam radiotherapy to the surgical site. And this occurred four months after his surgery. He was also referred to the genetic service. And although he did not have a, a sequencing uh, sequence variant in his CDC73 gene, um, his multiplex ligation dependent probe amplification assay analysis revealed that he had a large deletion. Uh, so it was heterozygous for a large deletion in his CDC73 gene. But this was consistent with a, a diagnosis of um, hyperparathyroid jaw tumor syndrome and highlights some of the sequencing difficulties with the different techniques that, it was, uh, that were raised in the last talk. Uh, so as is sort of typified by his whole presentation, he then got lost to follow up a little bit again uh, and, and came back two years later with some symptomatic hypercalcemia, now with a calcium of 4.22 and a PTH that had risen again um, up to 150. This was resistant to IV fluid rehydration and bisphosphonate infusions, and he was uh, given some denosumab, which he was responsive to. In looking for possible sites of disease recurrence, there was nothing in the neck, but a, a sister MIVI scan revealed that there was a uh, likely metastasis, uh, part of his T8 vertebrae, which you can see left on the MIVI scan, and right, you can see the uh, metastasis here on an MRI. He went on to have this biopsy just to check that it exactly it was exactly what we thought it was, and the biopsy result was positive uh, immunohistochemically for PTH. The key 67 was now at 10%, and he was referred to the neurosurgeons for a metastatectomy, um, and postoperatively his calcium was normalized and his PTH came down to 25. He had a follow-up uh, bout of external beam radiotherapy to his spine, and then uh, had a period of stability in his calcium and condition. This lasted about six years, but then unfortunately, his calcium started to rise again, and he presented with new and recurrent bony disease, which was causing him a large amount of pain. And the calcium levels were now uh, very troublesome, requiring regular denosumab infusions. Repeat imaging revealed that there was uh, the burden of disease was now uh, in other vertebrae and in the, uh, the rib cage, and he underwent a large procedure for a left lateral thoracotomy a T8 corpectomy and a metastatic debulking with a cage reconstruction in 2022. This was followed up by further external beam radiotherapy to new disease in his thoracic vertebrae one to three for new deposits um, this year. So to summarize the case, it's a 58 year old gentleman as he is now with hyperparathyroidism jaw tumor syndrome. He presented with parathyroid carcinoma and suffered from severe hungry bone syndrome post-operatively after his primary resection. He's had two large surgical debulkings of skeletal disease with two bouts of external beam radiotherapy, but unfortunately has ongoing skeletal disease progression. His calcium levels are now managed with denosumab every two months, 
Uh, but unfortunately, the uh, protracted period of hypercalcemia is having a, a toll on his kidneys, and he's under the nephrology clinic with uh, stage five chronic kidney disease. Uh, and this final graph is just to show his calciums in the last sort of 18 months or so. Uh, the, you can see on the y-axis that some of these calciums are getting up to nearly five uh, millimoles per liter. Um, and so he remains very denosumab responsive, but it doesn't last very long. And although that the surgery had bought him a bit of time in terms of calcium normalization and improved with some of his uh, skeletal disease pain, it hasn't really held things. And the uh, recurrent disease in the skeleton now means that he is uh, uh, still hypercalcemic requiring of these infusions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was an absolutely exceptional presentation of a very, very rare, um, very rare case. Any questions or comments? Um, I think... Dr. Cox and uh, Dr. Beckery, no, we, we, we've been referred a patient 18 years old with a not dissimilar presenting thing. And this sort of um, is a sort of a glimpse into what can happen uh, and makes us very wary to jump into early surgery. So she has a ALP of 6,000. I think yours had 1,000. So that suggests a lot of very high skeletal turnover and probably might be a marker of how bad the hungry bone uh, syndrome might be subsequently because it's a sort of, uh, a marker of osteoblast uh, function. So we took the decision. Had, she was listed for surgery very early on, but we took the decision to actually try and correct her skeleton early on. I think this is a good example of what we should do. And uh, I th Will Drake talked to me about this case actually in the past, so he was very helpful in that respect. Thank you. Hi, uh, I enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Um, so, two questions: Does he have any jaw tumours? He had the he had an ossifying fibroma that was removed in 1991 from his maxilla. And we were told as surgeons that um, sinicalcit was the wonder drug for parathyroid carcinoma and managing malignant hypercalcemia. So, why is it not working? I think in, in this, the extent of his PTH was so high that it, it couldn't be overcome by the sinicalcit at the dose, the maximum dose that he could tolerate, because it frequently causes quite a lot of nausea in some patients as well. I think it works in about 60% of patients with parathyroid and brings it into the normal range, so there are some that are resist resistant. And also the recurrence is very common in parathyroid carcinoma, although it's quite an indolent disease, the morbidities from the hypercalcemia, obviously, mainly. Um, but the recurrence is what you have shown here, and it's about 50, it's over fifty percent, I think. Yeah. Okay. If there's no further questions, we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. All right. So it gave me great pleasure to introduce Professor. Fausto Palazzo, who is a consultant endocrine surgeon at Imperial. He's also the clinical lead for endocrine surgery here, and he's also on the Council of the International Association of Endocrine Surgeons. And today he will give us a talk on reoperative parathyroidectomy, lesson learned from 20 years at Hammersmith Hospital. Okay, yeah, you've seen the Indian rhinoceros already, so you must be yeah, sick of it by now. So I, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, reoperative parathyroid surgery, and I, I gave the subtitle almost 20 years because 19 years doesn't sound quite as good, I thought. So first of all, you should start with some definitions. Um, now most people know this def these definitions, but uh, actually I get correspondence um, that suggests otherwise. So the difference between persistent hyperparathyroidism and recurrent hyperparathyroidism is that a persistent hyperparathyroidism is one where the patient has had surgery with an intention to cure the hyperparathyroidism but have failed to do so. You might say that this is a surgical failure. Recurrent hyperparathyroidism is when the patient has been cured and endocrinologists and endocrine surgeons have drawn a line in the sand and said, let's call it six months. So you can imagine that every surgeon will do anything he can, he or she can, to drag out their, um, their cure to six months. So, so if you want to have no persistences, what you do is you see the patients with uh, borderline results and say, I'll see you in six months and one day. And, and it's for this reason, if you look at case series uh, from single departments, you find that the rate of recurrence is much higher 
Yeah, but when you look at a meta-analysis, like the one published quite recently in the JCNM, you find that recurrence is actually very uncommon. Yeah. So most of the time, if, if there's a problem, it's persistence rather than recurrence. And it should be it should be underlined that between around 15% of patients after a successful parathyroidectomy will have normocalcemic post-parathyroidectomy hyperptia shunia. This is a physiological event which is incompletely understood. Of course, sometimes it's related to vitamin D deficiency, but there are other phenomena like bone remodeling that may be responsible for it. But as we know from uh, the work of Ang uh, Anders Bergenfeld, there's a subgroup of these patients that actually have persistent disease and it manifests itself, thankfully, after six months. So we don't look so bad. I'm not going to talk to you about other scenarios that of re-intervention, re um, where, it's, for example, a patient's had a thyroidectomy previously or cervical spine surgery or esophageal surgery. That's a technical, sh technical issue of re-intervention. I'm only going to talk, to talk about patients with primary hyperparathyroidism that have, have had parathyroid surgery. Now, this talk is going to uh, consist in five different events. And if you, can, if you could consider it as five links in a chain, each one of these links is fundamental. So if you have one weak link, then the outcome won't be quite so good. And these five principles can be found in the uh, Anglo-American guidelines, if you like, of reoperative parathyroid surgery, instigated by the ubiquitous Greg Randolph um, and head and, head and neck surgeons in the US and a, a variety of endocrine surgeons from the UK and sprinkling from mainland Europe. So the first thing we need to do is confirm the diagnosis, and I am not going to tell this audience how to make a diagnosis of primary hyperparathyroidism. But I will, I will say this, that in re-intervention, the need to make a robust diagnosis is, is more important because of this issue of what we've heard already, and that is that there's a subgroup of patients who have been misdiagnosed, even though they have uh, a calcium to creatinine clearance ratio, which is diagnostic. So th there is uh, an issue about so sometimes needing to perform genetic testing, but we've heard very eloquently that within the guidelines, there is no automatism to performing genetic testing in pers persistence of recurrence, because persistence and recurrence is such a a heterogeneous group of patients. And sometimes it's just that the original surgery, surgeon didn't find the adenoma even though it was there, rather than it being multiple gland disease. So we've made the diagnosis, let's work on that principle. The next thing that has to happen is, is the process of reviewing everything that's happened before. So the first thing we like to do is get the original localization studies uh, prior to the original surgery. but this doesn't just mean looking at the reports, it, it also means looking at the images, because sometimes you get some clues from that which explain everything and explain why the patient still has a, a ongoing primary hyperparathyroidism. Now, when I received the operation note, I asked myself a number of questions. First of all, I tried to work out who wrote the operation note, because that does have a big, make a big difference. And it, what's interesting is you would imagine, as somebody writes all his own operation notes, that the surgeon writes his own oper operation notes. But in fact, that's not the case. It can be written by anybody. The other thing I've noticed is that we have an increasing number of template operation notes. And this is partly, partly related to creating pro formas and partly because of the introduction of information technology like Cerner. So people type the report. And th these reports aren't always quite as clear uh, as you might imagine. And, you, and the other thing to ask yourself is, when was this report written? Was it written in the afternoon after the operation? Because even that is practice in some environment. And what actually happened? How many glands were removed? Did they remove a bit of thyroid? Was the thymus removed? All these things are worth knowing because it's going to affect what you do at surgery. Now, I said that I'd tell you what's happened over the last 19 years. What I've, I've learned a few things. And the first thing, first thing I've learned is that sometimes right and left get confused. Now, that sounds incredible. Doesn't it? I have two cases where the right and left was mixed up. And it's repeated all the way through. It's repeated in the pathology. 
as well as in the operation note. So that's the first thing. But something which is far more common, and it will happen to even the most experienced surgeon, is to not be able to distinguish with absolute certainty an inferior and superior gland. I challenge any experienced surgeon here to say oh, that they haven't had that moment where they see a parathyroid gland and cannot decide whether it's an inferior or superior gland. And that has a massive impact on the gland that you're then going to go looking for. Because of course, if you think that the superior gland has been removed, you're not going to look in the places where superior parathyroid glands tend to live or hide. So that's a problem. Another problem is that the fact that the parathyroid gland has been removed from a particular position doesn't mean that the persistence or the recurrence isn't in that same position, for reasons which I'll show you in a moment. So here we are, have a couple of examples, fortunately, all very recent. So on, the, on the, uh, this, this, this image here, you see a parathyroid adenoma and a completely normal parathyroid gland attached to it. So this, this explains how you can remove the adenoma and leave a parathyroid gland still there. Or equally, this very nice uh, uh, example here of kissing parathyroid adenomas, as, they, as they're often called. In other words, a superior and an inferior gland stuck to each other. And this is proven histologically. So it's very easy to misinterpret this either as a single gland, and in fact, and so you remove two glands and, and you're still looking for one gland that actually isn't there because you've already removed it, or for the purposes of this talk, where you misinterpret what you found, you found an adenoma, it's an obvious adenoma, but the other thing that was stuck to it is still there and is an adenoma. So you can see how interpreting what, what you've been told is, is very important. Then you have to review the histology. We tend to do this at the uh, MDT. And, and if you can, try and link the op operation notes with the histological report. And if there's a frozen section, get that. And if there's an interruptive PTH, which would normally be on the operation note, review that as well. So at this point, we have a diagnosis. We've review reviewed all the information. And it's time now to consider where we go from here. And if in normal primary hyperparathyroidism, I think you will agree now that thanks to the NICE guidelines, which have essentially said surgeons are cheap or certainly cheaper than monitoring. So if the patient has a reasonable life expectancy, they will be, they will be offered parathyroid surgery almost automatically now. That doesn't apply to persistent or recurrent hyperparathyroidism because the threshold has to be a little bit higher because the risks of reintervention are higher. So you have to look at the, the scenario, and this is assuming the patient wants surgery, by the way, you have to look at the scenario with care. How old is the patient? How long do you expect them to live? What are the comorbidities? How severe is the biochemistry? What's the end organ damage? And then we have this whole issue of neurocognitive change. And you must remember that there are some patients who are incredibly affected by this and very motivated uh, to have something done. And of course, we are still, at times, somewhat skeptical about the, the at symptomatology. And of course, we want to know before we reintervene or consider reintervening, does this patient have bilaterally normal functioning vocal cords? Because of course, that will change the balance of risk considerably. And all this, all this decision making has to be shared with the patient. So this is the, we've decided we're going to re-intervene, so it's time to image. And this is the dream scenario. Unfortunately, this dream scenario of a sesta scan, which has a light bulb and, a power and an ultrasound, which shows a, a, a co-located parathyroid adenoma, this scenario is a rarity. This is not what happens. What happens usually is some other nuanced first line imaging. Like this patient. So this is a patient operated by uh, an experienced surgeon uh, who had a parathyroidectomy, found three parathyroid glands, but could not find the left inferior parathyroid. So quite understandably thought maybe this is an intrathyroidal parathyroid and did a left hemothyroidectomy. As you can see, the left thyroid lobe is missing. But this surgeon, like I said, an experienced surgeon, didn't look at the Sestolevi scan. He just read the report, and the report said that the Sestolevi scan was negative. And if you go and look at it, it was this abnormality here was just like it is on the first image—a faint 
abnormality in the medius diamond. So it, that parathyroid gland, the surgeon could have been there for another two days and would not have found that because the gland is in the chest. And here's another patient with parathyroid in the chest. He, uh, he's a, by the way, uh, this is, he's a personal trainer in case you think that all our patients are as fit as this man. He's a personal trainer from Norfolk. He had two parathyroidectomies uh, and persistence in Norfolk. And then he did a crowdfunding to go to Tampa, Florida, to go to the center where the cure rate's 99.99%, according to their website, but he was not cured. He was not cured for a reason. He was not cured because the parathyroid gland was in the chest. At that time, this, is, this was uh, a long time ago. I'm sorry to upset Amy by saying this was, this was our first ever thoracoscopic list. And Amy at that time was a young registrar. And at that time, if a cestamoeba was negative and the ultrasound was negative, we went to inter interventional radiology. We were one of the few centers that were still doing venous sampling with angiography. And um, the reason is because we had the expertise here, which was unusually good. You have to have a great deal of patience. And so the, angi the angiogram showed us a blush here, and then you measure the uh, ETH levels in the venous drainage, and they're, they're much higher than the background and you've got a diagnosis. So this man, or based on this, could have a thoracoscopic resection. And this is just the, a publication from that time showing how good our venous sampling angiography was, especially in ectopic glands. In, in glands that were located in more conventional positions, it can be more difficult to interpret. But our results were better than all the other in, uh, uh, radiological interventions that we had. So sesame, the ultrasound, and, and CT, which at that time was not 4D CT, were nowhere near as good. And 4D CT, of course, when it did arrive, was of great help. Because what it did is it combined the cross-sectional imaging with the angiographic benefits, if you like. So a normal parathyroid gland on a non-contrast scan is hypodense. So there's a thyroid, and that would be a parathyroid there. And we see it when we get contrast. Now, parathyroid gland enhances after about 20, 25 seconds, which is quicker than the thyroid. And then, so we get the, you get the parathyroid, which enhances, but so does the thyroid. But then it washes out quicker. So you can see that you need somebody who has a real passion for looking at these images because it's a subtle thing and you've got to get the timings absolutely right. But when you do, you, you really do get a, a, a lot of information on 4D CT. It becomes challenging, however, with 4D CT when there's no thyroid to look at as well, because you can't compare this abnormality here with something else next to it. And in these cases, you still have to have some other modality and the venous sampling can be useful, can be useful in these, these cases to demonstrate that the excess parathyroid hormone is coming from the chest. So we're still having to use, sometimes having to use multimodality imaging. This is, of course, pre-choline PET. But 4D CT is incredibly good at picking up some unusual abnormalities like this. So two, two and a half thousand parathyroidectomies. I've never seen a parathyroid adenoma in the piriform fossa, and I probably will never see one again. Um, an incredibly unusual place. So this is submucosal within the pharynx. And the worst thing about this kind of operation is that for the rest of your life, you'll always think when you can't find a parathyroid, I know where it might be. <laughs> yeah. Um, and just, just to underline, uh, this patient I operated on, and, I, and she had a complication. She had a pharyngeal leak afterwards because of a breach of the mucosa. So that's the problem. If you start thinking, I know it's, that, it's one of those rare ones, isn't it? And you're digging in there, you can create quite a bit of morbidity. This, on the other hand, is a woman. Let's see if I can move this out, out of the way. This is a woman from who had two previous operations in India. Now, the ultrasound scan was uninterpretable, 
but she had a 4D CT and demonstrated this enhancing lesion here on the sternomastoid. But there's another one on the sternomastoid on the other side. And on other images, she had some enhancing lesions sitting on the left thyroid lobe as well. So she'd ha after the first operation, she was cured. But in the second operation, sorry, in the first operation, she was not cured. The second operation, she was definitely cured, but then had a true recurrence. And the reason she had a recurrence is because of all these lesions. I'll move this back there again. And this is at surgery where this is that lesion sitting on the sternomastoid. And here, don't, that's the nerve monitor, by the way, touching the vagus. And here, this is the left thyroid lobe, and, you, and she has these lesions sitting on the thyroid lobe as well. So this woman had parathyromatosis due to the dispersal of parathyroid tissue, probably due to a capsular breach at one of these operations. Now, that's, this is a very difficult problem to treat. She's actually only a few weeks post-op, and time will tell but this tends to recur. So uh, going back to the changes that we've made over time, you see that venous sampling started to decrease in its use in our department as the 4D CT started to increase in its use. And the other, and the other uh, modalities pretty much stayed the same. Now, this was the change here we divided between pre and post the introduction of 4DCT in around about uh, 2014. And as you can see, at the, in around 2019, choline PET started to show its face. Choline PET uses uh, uh, the labeling of um, choline, which is a, a phospholipid precursor on the membrane of the cell. So we, when the... Uh, the, the cells are proliferating more, you get more uptake of the radio labeled choline. And it's originally used in prostate cancer, but is now uh, regularly used in reoperative, currently in reoperative parathyroid surgery only. And it does produce some fantastic images. Here's a, a, a utopic persistence in the left inferior position, but it becomes really incredible when you start to look at ectopic parathyroid glands, which you wouldn't see in any other way. You know, here's an example of a, an ectopic parathyroid gland here. And then the interesting thing is you go, oh, let's go back and look at the CT. But who would have, call, who would have called that a parathyroid adenoma? Um, so it's easy afterwards to say that, that it was there already. But in fact, it makes it a lot easier when you have this sort of image. And of course, this was a, a high lesion uh, where the hypoglossal nerve was at risk. Another ectopic parathyroid gland, this time in the carotid sheath. And sometimes you worry that these lesions are false positives, either it's a lymph node or it's um, a paraganglioma at the bifurcation of the carotid artery. So sometimes you need to do a fine needle aspiration to confirm that this is really the source of the problem. We've, we've had incredibly good results with choline PET in ectopics in the chest. And here we have the example of uh, aortopulmonary window parathyroid adenoma. Parathyroid adenoma is a very difficult place to go. If the, if the lesion is in the anterior mediastinum, like in the, the personal trainer, then you can do it the operation thoracoscopically. Our, our experience with taking these out thoracoscopically is, is not good. So... Over this time frame, 200, uh, more than 200 reoperative parathyroidectomies. What have we learned? Well, from what we've learned over this time in terms of imaging is that we're using less and less interventional radiology and 4D CT and choline PET have pretty much taken over. So you'd be pleased to hear we've got to the fifth link in this chain, and that is the reoperation. And You've got to know, really, when you do this operation, what you're looking for. You've got to know whether you're likely to be dealing with single or multiple gland disease. And so we've heard that there's a role of genetics, because if you, if you know that the patient has MEN1, then you have to factor that into your surgical strategy. And, you know, reoperations can actually be pretty, pretty straightforward if it's a single gland and you know exactly where it is and there, not, there hasn't been too much disruption of the surgical field. But there's the other end of the spectrum. You know, an MEN1 patient with prior single gland removal after a four gland expiration, perhaps they didn't know that that 17-year-old girl 
uh, had an MEN1 that just went in, took out a single adenoma, had a good look around, and then left. And then three years later, four years later, you have to re-intervene uh, on multiple gland disease. Um, this is uh, our uh, historical paper on where the parathyroid glands are. And the reason I show this and this, uh, this image from Alan Sipperstein is that I've shown you a lot of ectopic glands, but most reoperative parathyroid surgery is for eutopic parathyroids. They're usually in the neck. So the surgery, why, why is there a mystique about the surgery? Well, because the cure rate is much lower and the risks are much higher. And that's for that reason that the threshold for surgery has to be higher because you know that you, you're, you're not going to cure 95% plus of patients um, and your vocal cord palsy rate won't be almost zero. It's going to be significant. So how do you minimize risks during the surgery? Well, it's surgical planning is fundamental. You've got to know where you are going to go and you've got to have a plan B if things don't work out as you expected. You have to, you have to use an approach. I like to call it the, the Star, Star Trek approach, which is to boldly go where no man or woman's previously been. So you go into a, a, a virgin field if possible, if you can find a virginal field, and then work your way back into where you think the abnormal parathyroid is going to be. And of course, if the parathyroid is that you, you're looking for is in the chest, then you have a, a, a couple of options. It's I think that people can argue about the proven value of nerve monitoring, but here there's no discussion because in reoperative parathyroid surgery, you have to have a nerve monitor because the risk of, of voice change is, is significant and probably probably significantly higher if you don't use nerve monitoring in a field of scar tissue. And finally, we know that the imaging tells you where, where you should start your operation, but the interoperative PTH tells you when you can stop your operation. And in, in a re-intervention, what you want is the least time possible of just looking. So that when you've found the abnormality and you've removed it, to know that you have cured the patient means you need, with interoperative PTH, you know that you can stop looking. And that is a, a, a real bonus. So in conclusion to this talk, what have I learned over the last 19 years in reoperative parathyroid surgery? Well, I've learned that you have to follow an algorithm and if you try to skip a step, you can get your fingers burnt. You've got to choose the patients in which to operate uh, with care and make sure they understand the risks and the potential benefits. Remember that most parathyroid glands are utopic. And I think if there's anywhere where you are allowed to be diffident, to be a doubting Thomas, if you like, is in reoperative surgery. Don't believe, don't believe the operation note without reflecting on it. Don't believe the imaging without seeing the imaging reports, without looking at, the, at them yourself, for example. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for this very eloquent and very clear talk. So we've got time for some questions. Thank you, uh, Professor Palazzo. Excellent as always. Uh, have you calculated using colline PET as upfront uh, examination rather than just in the troublesome cases? Um, the answer to that is no, we have not. Uh, and the main reason is availability. So this is not, it's not readily accessible, um, can only be uh, used at the moment in re, in re interventions in our institution. I do know that in some parts of the world, in, in Holland, that published on this, how they use choline PET uh, instead of Sestamibi. Uh, but I don't think there's any evidence that it's truly superior uh, to Sestamibi, and in particular... <laughs> And, and in particular, if you are going to compare it to anything, I think you you could compare it to 4DCT at its best, if, if you're going to use anything. Exactly. Well, Faster, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Um, do you have a different strategy? Because you can't be quite so cynical when the first surgeon who failed was you. How do you cope with 
do you cope differently with the patient in that situation? I think you're, that's a very good point. That's a very good question, a very good point. And I think many of the physicians in the audience may, may not tune into this. And that is, there's no doubt that if you have failed, that uh, it can be more psychologically challenging. In the case of the woman with the, um, the parathyroid adenoma in the piriform fossa, she was my failure. And of course, you and I know that you think, oh, nobody would have found that anyway. I mean, you'd never find. But the biggest challenge for a, a surgeon is if is to, to leave the operation thinking it's not in the neck. It's not. In, I can you walk away. I, I know it's not in the neck. And if you find that it is, and that will happen, it will happen, then that's really disappointing. And having to go back in those circumstances, yes, because the the problem then is failing again. But you, you're quite right. But I don't. I think maybe it's it's having been having a, a grey hair. I think does change your outlook, and I think you you realise that it's going to happen. You're going to fail, and that you have to wipe the slate clean, clean, and go through those five steps again. So go and make sure the diagnosis was right, and that you haven't you, somehow along the, somewhere along the line something's been missed. You, that's it's really important to avoid that. Excellent. Can I just ask you, there's a very widespread practice of transplanting parathyroids, which I totally support during thyroidectomies when they are accidentally removed, but I've been very vocal about transplanting pathological parathyroids in MEN1 or MEN2. So have you ever had a case of a recurrence from the transplant? And okay. if you didn't, do you think that this is simply because this transplants don't work anyway? Okay, so I, I come, if you like, I come from a background I think similar to yours in the sense that I also transplant parathyroids, which I think are not viable. Um, in mainland Europe, Germany in particular, the, 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 the let's say the, the leaders in, in endocrine surgery have spoken in MEN1 syndrome of total parathyroidectomies and auto transplant into the brachioradialis. Well. I have a very strong view on that. And the reason is because as a fellow, after after being in Sydney for a year, I spent a year in Marseille. And one of the jobs of the fellow was to go and take out scar tissue from the forearm when the patient had recurrence. And then they proved, of course, I should point out, I don't know if people understand what, what the strategy is. In MEN1 syndrome, the, the feeling was, and still is in some places, you do a total parathyroidectomy. And then you take one of the parathyroids or half of one of the parathyroids and you morselate it or you break it up and you implant it into the brachioradialis muscle. And there is a take rate. There's a failure rate, there's a take rate. But the interesting thing is when the patients have recurrence, the commonest site for recurrence is the neck. So the whole principle of the operation is not to have to reintervene in the neck, but most of the time you have to go back to the neck. So it's a, it's a flawed strategy in my opinion. But if you, then, of course, there's, a, there's a, something called the Casanova test to distinguish, you put a cuff on the arm, yeah, where the parathyroid was, was inserted, and you see whether the parathyroid hormone level drops. Yeah? So then you can say, okay, if the parathyroid hormone level drops after I've cuffed the, the arm, then the recurrence is in the arm. If it doesn't fall, the recurrence is in the neck. If it works, yeah, exactly. But but it, sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. It's not. But as the as the fellow, in other words, just one one level up from uh, the porter, they'd say, okay, Fausto, what today? Today, there's the, can you go and take out the the? Can you go and take out? There's a recurrence in the forearm. So first of all, it's not somewhere you go the forearm. You know. The second thing is you never knew when to stop because. It's so scarred, you go, hang on, I got it all. I don't want to be in the embarrassment of having a persistence from the forearm. So you, as you, well, let's take a little bit more. Let's take a little bit more muscle. That's a bit scarred there. Let's get, and so it's a horrible operation. You never know whether you've achieved what you set out to achieve until this was pre-interoperative PTH. You, so it's a horrible operation. And I, I don't understand why it's continued. I think it's just dogma. <clears throat> Can I take up that point that uh, take a bit, a bit further the question that David asked about yeah. who would do the redo operation? And the reason I ask is because I have experienced not recently happily of a parathyroid surgeon who on meeting a failure, which would be rare, would be personally 
disappointed, irritated, and we go straight back in. And I couldn't help thinking, you missed the first, you're going to miss the second, and we're going to get somebody else to do the third. Wouldn't it be better to have somebody else do the second rather than the third? Do you have a feel for whether there should be a referral pathway for redos, which might not be the first surgeon? Is that a difficult question to, oh, to, to yes, put? That's a really difficult one. I think, I think I'm privileged because I work in a, a, a multi, I have multiple people in my team. So I, I have the option. First of all, I have an MDT, but I have colleagues that I can sense check what I'm doing. But what you've described, I did a medical legal case on a patient that had two parathyroidectomies for FHH. So, that, so I think you need to stop. You need to stop, take a deep breath, check it all again, and then consider it. And if you're affected that's emotively uh, by the by the reintervention on somebody you've operated on previously, you have to have the strength of character to say, "We'll operate with your colleague or give it to your colleague." But for me, it would be mainly sense checking with See, my I, colleagues. I, I'm, I'm almost tempted to say that we should have a rule to say nobody does a redo; they all come to you. Now that's no, a bit no. a bit, it's a bit steep, but but I just don't want the guy tenaciously going on and on. You know, when he can't get there. We've probably got time for the quickest of quickest comments. <laughs> I just want to say that um, clearly one shouldn't blame the surgeons. And uh, our role as medics is really do do the genetics before you send for redo, because we are, that's where we find our problems. And I probably, a third of the cases that haven't been cured have been my fault, because actually they've turned out to have a genetic diagnosis, which I didn't realise before. So they're really generous on that genetic services. They send you an email and you can say, look, I really clinically, I suspect this and please do it because it's not on the list, recurrent primary hyperparathyroidism, but please do it because um, an awful lot of FHH cases pop up in that group, just as fast as I mentioned. Yeah, that was a lovely lecture. Thank you. <laughs> I think Davis really wants to have the last word. Yes. <laughs> yes, as always. I have to disagree with James. Um, redo operative, redo parathyroid surgery is very tricky and really should be reduced to a few centers. But even experienced surgeons will have failure. And uh, it's, uh, I, I think, unnecessary to say that when that happens, they immediately should refer on to someone else. Where I think a lot of pressure comes is if the surgeon has failed to mention to the patient at the consent for the first operation that they might fail. And if you said, yeah, it's 90, I've got a 98% success rate, the patient only ever hears 98. And so in the consent, we know the commonest complication of a first-time parathyroid operation is failure. And you have to do that. And then you can say, look, I'm sorry, but you are one of my 3%. And then you've taken that um, emotion away. They still look at you suspiciously. You've still got to maintain their confidence and everything. But if you've started with the idea that you're amazing and now you've failed them, You've already shot yourself in one foot. Okay, I Brilliant. think we do need to move on. Um, so thank you so much. Really um, great take home messages for all of us and um, insights into, into what it's like to be a surgeon. So fantastic. So um, our next talk, which I think is going to be presented by uh, Joshua Aglinko, is about uh, persistent primary hyperparathyroidism cured by diagnostic FNA. So a very intriguing title. And thank you, Joshua. Good afternoon. So my name is Josh Agilindra. I work with Prof Palazzo and Ms. Amy DeMarco and the rest of the endocrine surgery team here at Hammersmith. And I hope to present a case um, which should be brief and interesting. Um, a bit of introduction then. So we know, as Prof Palazzo mentioned, um, persistent primary hyperparathyroidism um, occurs in about 5% of patients after parathyroid surgery. And in these patients, you need quite meticulous um, workup to confirm diagnosis and help the patient along the pathway. And if first line imaging techniques fail to uh, help you along the line diagnostically, then you might result to doing a 
fine needle aspiration biopsy or a venous sampling plus minus angiography to help with the localization and for PTH estimation respectively. I'll summarize the case of a 62 year old female patient who was referred um, externally from up north with unlocalized primary hyperparathyroidism as her primary pathology. She underwent a four gland exploration um, and at the time intraoperatively, the two glands on the right were left alone, they were normal. The left superior gland was taken out, but it, um, histologically it was proven to be normal. But despite an extensive search by a very experienced endocrine and thyroid surgeon at the time, the left inferior gland was not found. The patient was then referred to um, our Center of Excellence, Sierra Hammersmith Hospital. And as you can see from these biochemistry, categorically, this is primary hyperparathyroidism, and we excluded key differential diagnoses such as familial hypercalciuric hypercalcemia. More importantly, this patient had and organ damage in the form of skeletal complications. She felt generally not quite right, and she also had quite debilitating neurocognitive impairment, <laughs> which is affecting her physically as well as um, psychosocially, which she wanted something done for, understandably so. Um, we knew this patient had had uh, multiple studies um, in the form of a sesame scan, an ultrasound scan, and a 4D CT scan. So we went straight to a choline PET scan. And as you can see on these images, um, there was a hot spot in an area um, with the, large, the largest diameter of less than a centimeter, just in a region just behind the left submandibular gland. The patient went ahead to um, our MDT, the thyroid MDT, for further discussion and recommendation, and a decision for further investigations was made. We went ahead and carried out an FNA of the lesion which was carried out by one of our experienced radiology consultants, Dr. Chris Harvey, for FNA um, PTH estimation. Um, and this was quite significant uh, diagnostically. And the PTH from this area of interest was very high. As you can see, it was over 200. A decision was then made for reoperative parathyroidectomy. Rather uniquely and um, something that we were not expecting. The patient during her pre-admission showed a completely normal biochemistry. So calcium and PTH were completely normalized. And this was only two weeks after her FNA was carried out. So we'll go to the Mentimeter and I'll put to the floor what people would have done in this scenario. Would you proceed to surgery? Um, thinking that we've done all these localization studies um, and we've not picked anything, but it could still be something. You postpone the surgery or you cancel the surgery altogether. So what we did was to postpone the surgery. And a year down the line, which was only a few weeks ago, the, the PTH calcium remained completely normal, even better than it was previously, two weeks after the FNA was carried out. And even more importantly, the patient's neurocognitive symptoms had all resolved, which is good news. So we know from studies that um, FNA, which is attempted diagnostically, and that leading to remission of primary hyperparathyroidism is very rare. And there's only five cases reported in literature. And often these patients' symptoms are short-lived after a period of having normal biochemistry. And there is a hypothesis um, of also parathyroidectomy, where the sequence is, you do the FNA, you get an acute bleed into the lesion, you get an um, extra or intracapsular hematoma and you get infarction. And then the lesion disappears and then the biochemistry normalizes and the patients feel better. So in conclusion, um, diagnostic FNA can be very useful and at times very necessary if you're not able to localize the lesion, but you still need to diagnose and get PTH estimation. And um, as I said, it's very rare and our case is quite unique in the in the in terms of the patient feeling better and normalization of the biochemistry after the FNA. As such, we need long-term surveillance of these patients. Um, and the question to the floor is, is it perhaps a time to do therapeutic FNA for parathyroid adenomas, um, obviously in selective cases? Thank you for listening.
Thank you so much, Josh. And as you say, absolute dream ticket. Very nice, concise presentation. And um, you and the patient felt better, which is marvellous. Um, yes, comments. Thank you. Thanks for this excellent case presentation. Uh, I wonder about, uh, we don't know about the pathology of this gland, but uh, pathologists uh, sometimes um, uh, show that hurtle cell tumors, that is oxophilic or oncocytic tumors, may go into necrosis after you put fine needles into them. So this might have been an oxophilic parathyroid adenoma. It's the same in the kidney and elsewhere in the body. So there is something with the mitochondria or something like that that makes them prone to go into necrosis after the fine needle. All right, so th that was one of the pa papers I looked at by Nylin and colleagues, and that's how they described how the um, patient in the pathway that led to the patient's resolution. Thank you. Can I ask a simple question about the neurocognitive symptoms, which was quite significant in this patient, but the calcium was not very raised. And the patient that we see with that of calcium normally are asymptomatic. So what are your thoughts about um, uh, again, you know, we're not 100% certain that all her neurocognitive symptoms mm -hmm. can be attributed to um, her high calcium levels at the time. But I think the first thing I can say is she felt much better after after the um, FNA was done. And and actually, when she came back to our um, our patient clinic to discuss mm -hmm. to to discuss um, plan for surgery. Um, when we said actually she didn't need any surgery, she didn't actually say, I, I want surgery. She was happy that her symptoms had got better and we should leave things as they are. Placebo effect? Sorry. Do we think it's a placebo effect from the surgery? Yeah, or actually, I, think, I think Josh has made, I mean, I, I, I am, I'm not a, a skeptic or cynic. I, I'm just trying to be realistic and evidence-based when it comes to the neurocognitive side of primary hyperparathyroidism. <laughs> But this lady was peculiar in that she felt better after the FNA. And so, of course, why would she? She had no idea that everything had normalized. So it's one of those cases where you start to wonder whether there is something in it. But um... OK, so we'll move to our next talk. Um, so I'd like to present Ms. Amy DiMarco, who is a consultative endocrine surgeon at Imperial. She's also the lead of anatomy and diagnostic within the School of Medicine. And she'll talk to us today about primary hyperparathyroidism in pregnancy. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation. So when I was considering the title, um, I turned over in my mind the fact that this is an area, primary hyperparathyroidism in pregnancy, of a relative paucity of evidence. And like Tom, I now feel it's okay to admit to the fact that when I'm considering how I'm going to approach a topic like this, I sometimes type it into Google. So I typed in evidence vacuum, thinking that I'd get some kind of useful array of other clinical situations where people have had to approach a, a conundrum with a paucity of evidence and some kind of help on how to do so. And instead, seriously, you get a lot, it's quite worrying, of vacuum cleaners designed to erase all evidence. <laughs> I can only presume of crimes. So if you do want to commit a crime, you can pick up for a mere $495 an evidence vacuum quite easily. But joking aside, what do I mean by an evidence vacuum? So primary hyperparathyroidism in pregnancy is without any formal guidelines. There are, for obvious reasons, no randomized controlled trials on the study. Um, I'm very proud to say that our group has still the largest case series at 17 published, although we've added uh, nine to that, which are unpublished uh, since that time. And if you look at the literature, you will find definitely no more than 180 published cases in total. So I think we can all agree that that is a relative paucity of evidence, but I would like to put the question back to the floor and ask how many of you have treated such a patient. So if we can go to the mentee, it's on. Let's look at the results. Okay, so that's interesting. So let's say half-ish, two-thirds-ish of the audience. Oh, the yeses are, are increasing as people think. Um, but so I think the interesting point there is that we have collective experience. So um, I think I have another mentee question next, don't I, Kareem? So I, I would next like to know how you manage that patient. 
for the 39 or so of you who had such a patient? Did you just monitor them to see what their calcium did? Did you offer medical treatment in whatever modality? Uh, did you refer or do surgery or did you do some of all of that? That's kind of what we predicted, that lots of people would sit on the fence. But actually, in reality, that may be what many of us do. OK, so so I just kind of like this quote, even though it's not perfect for the situation. But there's not a complete absence of evidence. There is some. It's just a matter of how we use it. And I think that there is sufficient in order that we can, uh, with our collective experience, come to some kind of conclusion about how best to treat these patients. So I do have a talk to give, and that's going to be uh, comprised around how common the condition is, when and how we should make the diagnosis, how concerned we should be about it, which leads into what we should do about it. So because we do not screen pregnant women in the UK or I believe anywhere in the world for hypercalcemia and therefore primary hyperpara, we don't know uh, the true prevalence of this condition. Well, does that matter? So I've not put this slide up just because it's traditional to kind of start a viva question with how common something is. It's because when you're looking at a rare disease, actually, you may learn quite a significant amount uh, about how it behaves, about the natural history, and therefore about how to treat it just by looking at the epidemiology. But we have to extrapolate because we don't have a definite measure of hypercalcemia in pregnant women. So if we look at the general population, we believe about 0.15% to have primary hyperparathyroidism. We believe that it's about twice as common in women, or we know that. Uh, and if we then try and drill down into how common this may be in women of, let's say, childbearing age, this is very unpolitically correct territory, but still, um, we have smaller numbers for obvious reasons. And these numbers kind of have to be viewed flexibly because the traditional definition of childbearing age up to the age of 40 is clearly not what we see in West London. Uh, so we would estimate probably, if you think about the fact that 0.05% of healthy women in this very large Israeli study of 30,000 people had primary hyperparathyroidism. So these are not pregnant women, these are just women at age 20 to 40. Or in this Swiss study, if you look at women in the same age group, about 0.036% had primary hyperpara, that approximately the same number of women will have primary hyperparathyroidism in pregnancy. Are you with me? Additionally, Fausto and I did a study looking at how common primary hyperpara was within a recurrent miscarriage clinic, and we found approximately that number. So let's say that something like three-ish women per 10,000 in pregnancy will have primary hyperpara. So it's not very common, but it's common enough that half of us have seen it or so. So we said that we're not testing everybody in pregnancy. Should we be doing that? Well, it's a bit difficult because traditionally we're told that we should test people for primary hyperpara if they have symptoms. But of course, all of the symptoms of primary hyperpara overlap with the symptoms of normal pregnancy. These women are passing urine all the time, particularly at night. They're a bit uncomfortable. Their abdomen hurts and they feel tired. You're a bit stuck and no further forward. And it's interesting in our series that 50% of the women were, we think, completely asymptomatic from a primary hyperpara perspective. So that's not a particularly good trigger for testing. End organ pathology, well, yes, if someone also presents with renal calculi in pregnancy, you're clearly going to test, or if they have an unusual fracture, or if they have pancreatitis, you must test their calcium. But otherwise, that's not a very helpful trigger either. What's really important and what is actually quite well known amongst obstetricians is that any pregnancy complication because of their increased incidence in women with primary hyperpara should trigger a search for primary hyperparathyroidism. But really, the most useful time to test a patient is before they get pregnant, hopefully so that some of these complications can be avoided. So how do we make the diagnosis? Well, it is slightly more difficult than in a non-pregnant person because of the normal physiological changes of calcium metabolism in pregnancy. So you will all know this, and it's a little embarrassing preaching to an audience of endocrinologists, but obviously during pregnancy, what is occurring is changes which are designed to optimize the placental availability of calcium for the fetal skeletal development. 
And that happened through an increase in the production of 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, which leads to an approximately twofold increase in gastrointestinal absorption of calcium. So a huge amount more calcium is absorbed in the GI tract. And by the way, I don't think we really know the mechanism by which there's increased 125-dihydroxy vitamin D excretion, but anyway, there is. Simultaneously, though, there is an increase in renal calcium excretion. There's also hemodilution, which progresses throughout pregnancy. And all of that means that actually there's a modest decline in the serum calcium of a normal pregnant woman, and there's a relative suppression of PTH. So although we would expect in primary hyperpara, obviously, to see an elevated calcium and an inappropriately unsuppressed PTH, we may need to be a little generous, but only if we want to select the very, very subtle diagnosis. Added problem is that, as you've heard, we do still traditionally use urinary calcium in order to screen out, hopefully, the patients with FHH. We cannot do that in pregnancy because of the increased urinary calcium excretion. So if we really think we're dealing with someone with FHH, we do need to get FHH genetics at the point of diagnosis. Now, I've written down here that MEN1 genetics are helpful. That's not to make a diagnosis. Obviously, that's once a diagnosis has been made in order to uh, plan the next steps. So what are we going to do next? Well, it's a truism to say that all of the patients in this group, so women of this age with this diagnosis, have a clear indication for parathyroidectomy as per the NICE guidelines that Fausto has already mentioned. The question is, are we going to do it now while they're pregnant or are we going to wait? I.e., should we con be concerned about it and should we be concerned about it at this moment? So I'm going to ask you. So we have a lady who... Uh, some of the teams may be familiar with here. So 32 year old in her first pregnancy, just beyond her first trimester. So early second trimester, who had an incidental finding of a slightly elevated corrected calcium with her GP. I genuinely don't really know why the GP did the test that they did. And when it was repeated, the calcium was nearly three with a PTH of seven. But I think interesting again, PTH, yes, it's inappropriately unsuppressed. But it's not that high perhaps because of the physiological change of pregnancy. She had no symptoms. She's got no known end organ damage, slightly irrelevant. Thus far, her first pregnancy has been uncomplicated. She's got no family history. So shall we go to the mentee? And I think I'm going to ask you, obviously, what do you think we should do? That is very interesting, isn't it? So this is a woman whose calcium range from kind of 2.6s, but up to 2.93, and we've got a complete range of results there. Fascinating. Probably shows there's no wrong answer, but anyway. So how concerned should we be about this patient? Well, it really comes down to what we believe the risk of the disease to be versus what we believe the risk of the treatment to be. So in terms of the risk of disease, as I said, there's not masses and masses of brilliant data on this, and they're very variable. So if you look at the published case reports, including our own, you'll find huge rates of maternal fetal complications, 70 to 80 percent. There's a really fantastic study which I've quoted there, preeclampsia at 25 percent, which is actually more like 6.89 times baseline, done in Sweden in Uppsala by Hella Hultens group and Per Hellman. So they took 50 patients with primary hyperpara and pregnancy at some point, so they were using a registry data, and they compared them to 500-ish patients without. And they found this nearly sevenfold instance of preeclampsia. And more concerningly, the fact that actually the risk of preeclampsia persisted for five years after those women were treated. Um, so you'll also find reports of mortality, both maternal, uh, the one reported mortality is a woman with severe pancreatitis due to primary hyperpower in pregnancy. And I should say that pancreatitis does seem to be more common in pregnant women than in non-pregnant women with the disease. Uh, and fetal mortality, which obviously tends to be from neonatal hypocalcemic tetany if the mother is not diagnosed. So lots and lots of horrible complications, which seem to be very prevalent. But that's when you look at the published series in which the calciums are 2.8-ish to 3. Our own series was 2.89, I believe. If you compare that to the cohort data, so this Israeli insurance study that I mentioned of 30,000 women, showed that there wasn't a significant difference in pregnancy outcomes between women with and without primary hyperpara. Uh, but... 
the calciums were only about 2.67, so much lower. And similarly, a study of 1,000 patients with primary hyperpower and 3,000 controls, um, these were patients who had allegedly no significant difference in miscarriage risk. However, lots of them had surgery. In fact, most of the patients with primary hyperpower had surgery. You kind of delete that one from the evidence bank. But it, it seems to be clear that uh, the outcomes are dependent on the degree of hypercalcemia. So what are the risks of the treatment? Well, let's talk about medical treatment first. So bisphosphonates cross the placenta and in animal studies are known to adversely affect people's skeletal development and are contraindicated. So let's say no to that one. So what about sinicalcit? Well, it's not formally contraindicated and it does cross the placenta and you get the usual blurb if you open up the BNF or any other uh, product guidance that it can be given where benefit outweighs risk. But if you think about it, it's acting obviously on the calcium sensing receptor, which is present in multiple fetal tissues. So it doesn't really seem like a very good idea to be giving this when we don't really know what the outcome is. And it's unfortunate that in primary hyperpara, uh, as opposed to the fantastic um, talk that Roshan gave earlier, we do suffer from an absence of data, certainly on the effects of these drugs subsequently. Uh, calcitonin is used, um, increases urinary calcium excretion. It probably doesn't do any harm, but it also probably doesn't really have much benefit or any benefits which there are, are short-lived. So it's a bit pointless. So let's say no to medical treatment then. So we're basically saying we're going to monitor the patient or we're going to offer them surgery. So what are the risks of surgery? Well, most people believe, I think it's fair to say, well, most people who haven't come to one of David Scott Coombs' lectures believe that you can only have a parathyroidectomy if you've had some imaging and or if that imaging is positive. Is that true? It's not. If we look at ultrasounds, well, it's clearly worth doing. It's of no harm to the woman or to the baby, and it may be positive. 95% is a very generous upper estimate. Uh, but ultrasound may be useful. And it's particularly useful because you're going to pick up any coincidental thyroid pathology, uh, which may need to be dealt with at the same time. Cestamib 4-DCT, obviously they all incur some degree of ionizing radiation. We think about five, six milligray. I think the American College of Obstetricians has said that five milligray is kind of an acceptable level. So it may or may not be okay to have a reduced dose cestamib but what's the point? It's going to be negative in a third of patients. It doesn't affect the outcome. It doesn't affect uh, the likelihood of success of a parathyroidectomy as long as the patient is managed in the right hands. So let's kind of put to one side any concern about imaging because it should be regarded as irrelevant. What about the concern about general anesthesia? Well, if you look at all comers having a general anesthetic in pregnant women, uh, we are told that there's an about 7% miscarriage rate, and that is about 10.5% in the first trimester. But that's in people with all pathologies, and therefore mainly in women who are having emergency surgery, i.e. they've got sepsis, they've got appendicitis, they've got cholecystitis. So you'd expect those women to have a fairly high rate of miscarriage on top of the background. And um, contrast, a really wonderful study that was done here by the Department of Anesthesiology, which looked at 10 million pregnancies historically over a 10-year period, and then analysed those according to what type of surgery the patient had undergone. So that left about 3,000 cases of kind of head and necky flavoured non-emergency uh, surgery. And the numbers needed to harm would be about 356 such head and neck operations in order to cause one stillbirth and 63 for a preterm labour. So it's pretty low risk in comparison to what we thought from this original study of a possibly 7% miscarriage rate. But it isn't zero. Now, uh, touch wood, in our department, neither of these things have occurred in our series of 26 or so patients thus far. But I have spoken to at least one surgeon who has had an experience with preterm labour uh, occurring during their parathyroid surgery. May or may not be relevant uh, in terms of the anaesthetic experience, etc. But it's something that one has to consider when weighing in the balance uh, how to treat these patients. 
So conclusion from this slide, ionizing radiation, harmful, not necessary, anesthesia, pretty safe in the second trimester. So back to our lady. So she does have an ultrasound, which is possibly helpful. It doesn't make it any comments about thyroid gland. It makes note of a nodule uh, and has a kind of vague report that it may be a parathyroid adenoma. So what would you like to do next? She's got calcium of 2.6, 2.9 ish. She's got this ultrasound scan. So are we going to do a MIBI? Are we going to do a 4D CT? Or are we going to offer her surgery? Not harmful. <laughs> Practical? Question mark. Okay. So, um, well, I've convinced lots of people that surgery is a great idea. I don't know if I wanted to do that, actually. Um, yeah, I excluded water because I view that almost as monitoring, but genuinely, it's not, it's not a very practical solution. I think if you're concerned enough about somebody's level of hypercalcemia um, that you're getting them in every two weeks for IV fluids, you probably do need to consider definitive treatment, and they're going to need surgery afterwards anyway. So uh, for this lady, yes, she had a parathyroidectomy. It's important to say, as I have done already, that um, the anaesthetist is a key person. So we're fortunate here in having dual qualified obstetric and endocrine anaesthetists. So they're happy putting a nerve monitoring tube in. They're happy delivering a baby. Not that we wish to do that. You need clear input from the obstetricians to scan the woman pre and post to check that the fetus is alive and well with a heartbeat. And then there is a surgical discussion about how you manage these patients. They're young, so they probably have a predilection for four gland disease and you have higher stakes. You can't really afford to operate on this person and not to cure them. So you either need to be doing a four gland inspection in order to make sure that no disease is left behind, or you need to know that you're going to stop your surgery by using interrupted PTH uh, and seeing it fall appropriately after the adenoma has been removed. Either approach is fine. You just have to know that there's no abnormal tissue remain. Uh, so that was a, a happy outcome. And uh, most, some of them are. So within our series, we do have an example of a patient who was offered but declined surgery in pregnancy and had a very bad outcome with preeclampsia and a growth restricted fetus requiring an emergency section who then came and had her surgery uh, postpartum and a sad case of a lady who miscarried before she could have her parathyroidectomy. Uh, in terms of the surgical outcomes, all of those who operated on in pregnancy were cured. We did have uh, a recurrence after a focused approach eight years later, um, so no six months obscuration there. That was a clear recurrence, um, and that lady was reoperated on and cured again and found to have an underlying undiagnosed genetic syndrome. Uh, there were no surgical complications. And in terms of the obstetric outcomes, one of the patients had a, a premature rupture of the membranes that delivered safely. So our feeling is this, that one should be guided by the level of hypercalcemia as to how best to manage these patients, uh, but that the only real options are monitoring or surgery. Now, the real question is, therefore, what is the level of calcium that you would accept in order to continue to monitor these patients? And at what point do you become uncomfortable? One of the really unfortunate things about this is, as the Swedish study shows, and as we know, that having your primary hyperpower treated during pregnancy will, to a degree, prevent some of the complications occurring within that pregnancy, but in some cases, it will be too late to prevent them. You're probably not going to stop them all from having preeclampsia because obviously that's something which has happened well before uh, the second trimester. Um, so managing the level of hypercalcemia is all that one can really do. So <clears throat> going back to what the approximate right answer will be, well, I think we found it. That, so our series, as I say, we had a calcium about 2.89. The published data uh, states cases with awful outcomes, 80% complication rates, but calcium is 2.7 to 3-ish, and the Israeli data of good outcomes, uh, the patients had calciums of below 2.7. So uh, our group estimate of 2.8 seems pretty reasonable. 
So in conclusion, is this an evidence vacuum or not entirely? How common is it? Um, we have estimated by extrapolation that it's going to be about 0.03% of pregnancies. How do we make the diagnoses pre-pregnancy, ideally, and with some, some modicum of difficulty during pregnancy uh, and using FHH genetics in terms of um, excluding that rather than using urinary calcium? Should we be concerned? Well, yes, based on the published case report, certainly of serum calcium is at 2.8 plus. And what should we do about it? Well, ideally, surgery in the second trimester, the rationale being that the rate of miscarriage is lower and the fetus is better developed if anything else happens further down the line. Uh, and at that point, the surgery, if it's going to happen, needs to happen in a high volume centre with good obstetric backup. So take some questions. Thank you, Amy, for this wonderful talk on a, a very important problem. Um, we've got we got a question online. Yes. I can read it out here. Can I just read it in? So there's a question about a first trimester hypercalcemia in a patient who previously had parathyroid surgery was not cured. What would you do for that patient? Previous parathyroidectomy but failed. Well, so it's a combination of, of this talk and Fausto's talk, isn't it? So the patient has primary hyperparathyroidism in pregnancy and should be treated on its merits in the same way as you would with anyone else, with a nod to the fact that if you get to a point where during pregnancy she needs a reoperative parathyroidectomy, you have to then use uh, Fausto's protocol or our departmental protocol to manage her. But you wouldn't say no to surgery. No. And there's a question that you heard earlier about the third trimester. Would you operate? Severe hypercalcemia in the third trimester. So, I mean, it, so the likelihood of inducing labour uh, in the third trimester with general anaesthesia is higher. So that's the rationale for choosing the second trimester, because you reap some benefits without inducing labour. But of course, if you do induce labour in the third trimester, the woman should be delivering a baby which is formed enough that it will survive and hopefully not have a terrible outcome. So I think I can see Roshan nodding, which is uh, nice <laughs> to see. So uh, you certainly wouldn't exclude that person from surgery just on the basis they're in their third trimester. In some ways, it's kind of reassuring. I just would like to make a point about IOPTH because there are two groups when the radiation is really not very in sort of it shouldn't take place, the children and pregnant women. So so, so in, in our practice, because we're such an early adopters of this technique, we stopped doing gland explorations for children and for pregnant women quite a long time ago. We never had your numbers because our obstetric unit is much smaller, but, but IOPTH never failed us. And it showed that the answer, cured or not cured, is always better than an ultrasound systemibi or ultrasound systemibi combined. So I think that there is a point I'm making is that if you have this technique, then you probably can do you know, minimally invasive focused surgery rather than full gland exploration. Yeah. Do you want to take that, Amy? I mean, I think the problem is you've got to remember the cohort you're dealing with is a young patient and young patients have a higher rate of multiple gland disease. And the ultrasound tells you, you I don't think you can, the interoperative PTH is fantastic, but the, the ultrasound is of value for two reasons. One, as Amy said, it allows you to exclude concomitant thyroid disease. You know, I understand there's a risk that you pick up things that are irrelevant, but nevertheless, it's a nice thing to know before you start. And, and you use you use the ultrasound to guide the beginning of the operation and interoperative PTH the end. Always ends up the conversation between Fausto and myself. <laughs> <laughs> but the but the IOPTH will tell you. So you do a small cut, take one. No, 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 ultrasound. You always start with an ultrasound. And then you have a negative ultrasound. And then you'll, which we do, you know, we'll have an, a completely negative ultrasound in a proportion of patients. There has to be something positive. But there doesn't have to be something positive in order to start the operation. We, we have a third of patients who are negative and either, this is non-pregnant, uh, negative either system of your ultrasound and a proportion who would be negative for both. And you would still start 
the operation. But I, I take your point, Tom. I guess the other point is one about the pendulum swing between uh, focused parathyroidectomy and full gland operation anyway. And the point of doing the operation in pregnancy is to get the woman to a point where she's no longer hypercalcemic. Does it matter whether eight months down the line her calcium is 2.65? Probably not that much, but she will have to have that managed before her next pregnancy. Just a quick comment, if I may, about your, your uh, quoting the BNF on sinicalcet in pregnancy. Could be, could be considered if the benefits outweigh the risks. Benefits? No idea. Risks? No idea. <clears throat> Take a set of scales and put nothing in either side and then tell us whether it's balanced or not. Okay. So I, I, I think it's a very interesting remark, but it really doesn't help us at all, does it? Well, it's, kind of, it's, it's also interesting to me that bisphosphonates would be considered by the BNF contraindicated and not sinicalcet. I mean, not a huge amount of difference in evidence between them. Okay, thank you very much, Amy. Great, so in case you were wondering, um, Prince planned such an action-packed afternoon, you do not get a tea break. So refresh your brains, because we've got four brilliant cases now before close of play. So um, the first case is going to be presented by Farhana Hussain, and it's talking very relevantly again about the role of surgery in managing hypercalcemia in pregnancy. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bohana. I'm one of the medical registrars at Queen's Hospital in Romford. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about a case. Oops. Yeah. Um, uh, and discussing the role of surgery in managing hypercalcemia in pregnancy. So this goes quite well um, after the great presentation we had by Dr. D. Marka. So we start off with a case. A uh, 35-year-old lady who was 12 weeks pregnant attended essentially containing six weeks of nausea, vomiting, and left therapy. Um, while she was inpatient, her symptoms just got worse. She has got no significant past medical history, and um, she was just on some supplements, pregnacare and folic acid, and she was taking regular antiemetics, Um, She underwent a blood tests, which showed that her calcium was raised and her PTH was raised as well. The rest of her urine electrolyte and her um, thyroid function was normal and her 24 hour urinary calcium was also elevated. Um, she went an ultrasound and on the left, you can see there's a, a small adenoma in the parathyroid. Um, so initially we managed her medically. We gave her quite significant IV fluids for 72 hours. Um, so her initial calcium was 3.5, we improved to 3.05. Um, but significantly, her symptoms had improved quite a lot, and they decided to discharge her uh, with a follow-up. Uh, but she was readmitted again after one week with uh, persistent vomiting, essentially, um, and her calcium was actually four. Um, so we had an MDT discussion with the surgical team, and they actually offered her a parathyroidectomy uh, at 14 weeks gestation. So this is just a, a trend of her calcium levels post-surgery. You can see it started at four and post-surgery after a couple of days, it had normalized. The histology came back as adenomas, so it wasn't uh, malignant. Um, so in summary with this case, um, following on with the presentation we just had with Dr. DeMarco, uh, one of the main causes of hypercalcemia in pregnancy is a primary um, hyperparathyroidism. The symptoms are similar to those of non-pregnant, but also we, we worry about preeclampsia uh, in these patients. Maternal complication rates may be as high as 67% and fetal complications as high as 80%. And some studies have reported that um, neonatal and uh, fetal mortality can be as high as 30%. Um, management, essentially, there's a medical and surgical option, but medical is obviously very limited. And um, we just had a talk about how we can give fluids, um, sinicalcid and calcitonin. Um, of note, this lady had quite significant vomiting, so she couldn't really take the sinicalcet. Uh, so that, that's one of the reasons why we didn't try that. Um, surgical option should be um, given as an option, but should be done in the second trimester. And in these cases, it's very important to have an MDD approach, so endocrinologists, surgeons, and psychological support as well. Um, 
So my main question is, has anyone in the panel audience had similar uh, experiences in managing hypercalcemia in pregnant ladies? And also, if you had this case, would you suggest some type of different management? Thank you very much, guys. I want, to, I want to ask you a question because we keep measuring the calcium, but we measure calcium in the morning, we measure calcium in the afternoon, and we measure calcium a week later. And you get three values, sometimes as different as 2.7, 2.9, 3.2. Which one are we going to take as, uh, to guide us what to do? I think it's quite important in these cases just to take it individually. A, the gestational age, but also the symptoms as well, like the disease, whether she's very symptomatic, um, uh, and essentially the calcium would also relate to that as well. No, I agree, but, 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 but the question, maybe we can throw it to, to, to experts sitting behind. Which calcium, do you do, you do a, a, a sort of a, a, some sort of statistical an analysis and you take a medium or you take the highest or the lowest, you're pessimist, you're optimist? Thanks. So um, the evidence that's out there is all based on peak serum calciums. So I suppose if one's going to compare this patient to the available evidence such as it is, that you should look at her peak. However, I guess that that's what led you down the road of offering her surgery at week 14, did you say? Yeah. So that is a tricky one. I can see why you would, because she's very symptomatic along with being hypercalcemic. But let's be honest, there are lots of women who have hyperemesis who can, horrible though it is, survive their hyperemesis and deliver a normal baby. Is this hyperemesis purely because of hypercalcemia? You don't really know. So my point is that if you're going to operate on someone at week 14, you are taking a, a little bit of a risk because obviously the division of trimesters is arbitrary, as we all know, and there is a, a gradual change in maternal fetal physiology. So the point is that during the first trimester, the risk of inducing miscarriage is the highest and the baby will absolutely not be viable at that point. In the second trimester, that risk is lower and you have some chance of giving the patient a benefit by controlling their hypercalcemia. So that's really the rationale for the second trimester. So if you're very concerned about the risk of inducing miscarriage, stillbirth, labor, whatever, then you need to, to push the date later as much as you can. But you're in a situation where you've also got a reasonably high and symptomatic calcium. I do think we probably would have gone a bit beyond week 14 though. Don't you think, Fausto, we'd we'd push that out as long as we could, even if it means admitting her on harmless IV fluids and then doing it at week 20 or something. Tom? Thank you. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. I thought I'd wake you up. So <laughs> I'm, I'm looking to our expert uh, next to James, because if you divide 40 by three, 14 is greater than that. Now, 14 just intuitively seems early to me, but is it not the second trimester? By definition, it, it is, I guess. You're absolutely right. But it, I think Amy, Amy's right to some extent. The further we can push it, the better in terms of risk of miscarriage. But of course, we need to be balancing that out against how unwell a woman is. If she's in a vicious cycle where she has severe hyperemesis and hypercalcemia is contributing further to the dehydration, then you could argue that maybe there is a case for doing it a little bit sooner. And I think it's, it's interesting. I think it's a bit dependent sometimes on the obstetric anesthetist we work with, because I know at Mary's, they are they have a lower threshold for saying, why don't we just go ahead and intervene? Because of course, like you say, that definition of trimesters is quite arbitrary. So I think it's it's that balance of where we are with the woman in front of us. And I also agree with Amy's point that the evidence is very much based on peak calcium in response to the earlier point that was made. And I think if we have somebody who has such a high calcium early in their pregnancy, then that tells us really that's probably only go, going to go one way as their pregnancy progresses. And of course, we want to try to be getting on top of things by the time this woman hits 20 weeks gestation, because that's when the neonatal parathyroids are developing. And so we know hypercalcemia in the mother will inhibit that development and therefore risk postpartum um, neonatal tetany. So just, just yeah, other, other thoughts to bear in mind. But I do agree, if we can push it, it's nice to be able to try to do that. Um, 
My name is Gideon and I looked after, after this patient at the time and the patient was very symptomatic. And she was a mother of two years old. She was a policewoman. Normally she's fit and well, she was very sick. So when we allowed her to go home for the first week, within days she, was, she became very unwell. And luckily we, we, with discussion with the surgical team, I think they were happy to offer her the surgery and we had a very good outcome with no complications. Okay, I think we'll move okay, on. Thank Thanks you so very much. much. That was a very good point. Thanks for that. Okay, so our next talk will be from Dr. Tanya Chopra from Barnett Hospital, who will talk to us about adsonin crisis as first presentation of varotoxicosis. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Tanya Chopra. I'm one of the registrars currently in Northwest London, currently working at Barnett Hospital, and I'm going to talk about a case we help manage at Barnett along with the rest of the team. So a little bit. So we report a 62-year-old lady who presented with an Addisonian crisis, secondary to new onset thyrotoxicosis, following an adrenalectomy for Cushing syndrome. So a little bit of the background for our patient. So she was previously diagnosed with Cushing syndrome due to a autonomous adrenal nodule for which she went a unilateral adrenalectomy in July 2019. Unfortunately, she remained on hydrocortisone 1055 due to a failure of recovery of her contralateral adrenal and suboptimal short synaptin tests following her original surgery. She also had significant past other history as well. Most notable of which she also had chronic kidney disease with renal tubular acidosis type 4, for which she was on fludrocortisone also. Had no significant family history of note. So she presented to our a &E department profoundly unwell. She reported a two-day history of flu-like symptoms, a one-day history of vomiting to such an extent that she was unable to tolerate her oral medications, such as her hydrocortisone and her fludrocortisone, and felt too unwell to administer a, her IM hydrocort injection. On initial systems review, she was noted to have an increased stoma output and a heat intolerance, but no other systemic uh, symptoms of thyroid disease at all. This was her initial examination on presentation. As you can see, she was hemodynamically unstable, with very dry mucous membranes, a sinus tachycardia, and profound hypertension as well. She also was noted initially to have an increased output in her stone bag, but also exophthalmos with a lid lag, which had not been noted in her previous clinic appointment, raising the suspicion of new Graves' disease. These were her initial investigations. As you can see, she had a significant AKI. Her baseline creatinine normally runs around 130. For her, it was around 550 with marked hyperkalemia of 6.9 and a significant metabolic acidosis also. Her other investigations were otherwise largely unremarkable, including a negative CT abdominal pelvis that was carried out. So looking at the invest investigations, and I know we haven't given you the TFTs quite just yet, but what do we think is the most likely differential diagnosis for this patient? I think so. So we give a bit of a clue there. To be honest, all of these were our differential diagnosis. And to be honest, we did try and cover for a lot of them. But our main suspicion at this point, when she was profoundly unwell, was that this was an adrenal crisis. So we can just go on to the next one. So given that, it, it, that we think it is a likely adrenal crisis, what would be the best strategy for managing this? Should we give her an IV hydrocortisone infusion over 24 hours? Should we give her high IV hydrocortisone with a stat dose initially and then six hourly? Or should we give her some IM hydrocortisone? Or should we just double the dose of her oral steroids? Okay, thank you. I'm just so for our patient, um, initially we felt this was an adenosine crisis. She had in fact already been given 100 milligrams of IM hydrocortisone by the paramedics. Uh, so when she arrived in the A&E department, we gave her 50 milligrams of intravenous hydrocortisone six hourly. She also had aggressive fluid resuscitation and was covered with broad spectrum antibiotics. Her hyperkalemia was treated and she was reviewed by ITU very early on because she remained quite unwell, but she did respond well to her original treatment. Because there was a suspicion of thyroid disease because of her clinical features as well as the sinus tachycardia, DFTs were sent. She had an elevated free T4 of 41, an elevated free T3, and a suppressed DSH. 
A TSH and TPO receptor antibodies that were also fed out returned later were also positive as well, confirming that she was thyrotoxic with Graves' disease. With regards to her further management, she was commenced on carbamazole 20 milligrams twice a day with propanol. Once her vomiting had settled, she was switched back to her double dose of her oral hydrocortisone and her fludocortisone was recommenced. Uh, and she was discharged back on carbamazole and hydrocortisone at her usual dose and is doing well in the community at the present. So why do we think this lady became so profoundly unwell as she did? And what really happened? So our working hypothesis is that when she had the Cushing syndrome, she had a very high production of her endogenous steroids, which suppressed her autoimmune system. When this Cushing syndrome was treated, it then unmasked her underlying autoimmune disease, listing the Graves' disease. She then became thyrotoxic, which resulted in an increased metabolism of her hydrocortisone, precipitating the adrenal crisis. So a few things going on, so to discuss them a little bit further. So we know when we have Cushing's syndrome, we have increased production of endogenous steroids. Thereby, when we treat the Cushing syndrome, we therefore resolve this high cortisol state. And the, some cases have found that this may unmask underlying un, uh, autoimmune disease in predisposed individuals, which for this lady was Graves' disease. Also for our patient, uh, she likely had undiagnosed thyrotoxicosis in the community resulting in an increased stress state, but also increased metabolism and clearance of her hydrocortisone, which precipitated her, uh, her adrenal crisis. And finally, she does have an inter intact contralateral adrenal, but given she has had adrenal crisis and she previously had suboptimal short synactin tests, could we slowly wean this lady off the steroids in the future? And I think we will uh, explore this further in the next talk also. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Thank you very much. Great case. I'm sure there'll be questions. <laughs> Who wants to start? Shall I start? Yes. Um, just, did you want to comment on whether or not you felt she met or thought about whether she met criteria for thyroid storm when she presented? So she did. Her birth and philosophy score was 45. Um, but the issue was when she came in, it was late in the evening. She had no known diagnosis of thyroid disease at that point. So her initial treatment was that of hydrocortisone for which she responded really well. And, you know, even with the thyroid storm, you know, hydrocortisone would be the initial treatment as well. And the carbamazole was commenced the next day when she was seen by the endocrine team with the TFDs that returned. So, yes, theoretically, if you, in record that calculate score, she did have a positive um, score on the birth rate. Just a brief comment. Um, 3T4, 41. We could play a game, couldn't we? If the 3T4 is 41, what's the 3T3? Six. No, they're slightly out of balance, aren't they? So she's probably got a bit of an inhibition of T4 to T3 conversion. So there may be a degree of non thyroidal illness behind all of this. Yeah, and I think she did have some iron hydrocortisone given by the paramedics. So maybe some IV hydrocortisone before this came back. So maybe there was some inhibition there already. Uh, so right. Yeah. I've got a question as well. Um, so based on your case, if you have a patient on steroid replacement, diagnosed with Graves and really thyrotoxic, would you, based on what you found, would you increase the dose of replacement steroid? So I think for this lady, she responded quite well to her initial hydrocortisone. And we felt by starting the carbamazole, that would then start suppressing the thyroid function. Mm -hmm. And so we felt the current dose of <laughs> hydrocortisone for her because we wanted her in hospital for a couple of days was sufficient. And she was hemodynamically stable on that. Okay. If you look at it, her thyroid function wasn't particularly deranged. And I think had she been from her TFTs with a T4 more than 100 with a very high T3, then maybe we may have considered a higher dose of hydrocortisone then. Okay. And your last question about weaning, who wants to answer that? Probably the next talk. <laughs> True. <laughs> okay. So should we leave it for the next talk? Thank you very much. No worries. Thank you. <laughs> So um, the next talk is going to be given, I think, by Kate Lazarus, and is um, the title is The Importance of Undertreating Adrenal Failure in Order to Allow Normal Adrenal Function Following Unilateral Adrenalectomy for Cushing Syndrome. So exactly answering the question that was just posed. So thank you for that. Great. Hi, so I'm Kate Lazarus. Um, I'm a registrar in Northwest London, um, and I'm currently doing my PhD with... Um, with Professor Mirren, um, and as a clinical research group, we've got an interest in how we can mitigate harm from glucocorticoid steroids. 
So in contrast to the previous talk, um, this is a case um, to illustrate really or to generate discussion um, how we might be able to wean patients who've undergone a unilateral adrenalectomy for Cushing syndrome off glucocorticoid steroids. So the case. There's a 28-year-old dentist who presented to her local hospital in February 2021 with menstrual disturbance, increased bruising, hair loss and weight gain. She had no past medical history of note um, and wasn't on any regular medications. Social history, she was a dentist, she was fit and well, exercised regularly, non-smoker and minimal alcohol. So she underwent some initial investigations, including urinary cortisol measurements, which were all raised. She underwent a low-dose dexamethasone suppression test, which didn't suppress, and of note, her ACTH was less than 1.5. And she then underwent a CT adrenal scan in April 2021, which showed a 3.4 centimetre homogenous hypoattenuating lesion from the left adrenal gland. If she was managed um, for suspected or, or for, for confirmed Cushing syndrome, um, she was discussed in the adrenal MDT and uh, started on a block and replace um, regimen uh, ending adrenalectomy, which occurred in August 2021. That was uncomplicated and she had a post op cortisol of 31. She was then started on a um, glucocorticoid uh, regime on discharge, um, which meant five milligrams for four days, four milligrams for four days, and then three milligrams onwards. And due to COVID, uh, she wasn't then seen in clinic until nearly a year later. And at that point, she'd been pretty well on three milligrams. She'd had one episode of being unwell when she'd forgotten her prednisolone, but her symptoms had resolved and she'd taken it early the following morning. And she doubled for an episode of COVID uh, back in December 2021. But the plan following clinic was for an SST. And these were her results. So based on these, what would you like to do? Switch to hydrocortisone, 10-5-2.5. Reduce her prednisolone to 2.5. Stay on 3 milligrams. Or increase to 4 milligrams. Okay. Yeah, interesting. Great, so yeah, we actually continued on three milligrams. Um, and the follow-up at the next appointment uh, was really to plan for prednisolone levels. And for those not familiar uh, with prednisolone levels, um, we take them really to help optimise dosing of prednisolone in terms of replacement. Um, and these were her results on three milligrams, and I've included the reference ranges there as well. And based on these results, what would you like to do? <coughs> Switch to hydrocortisone, reduce her prednisolone to two milligrams once daily, continue on the three milligrams, or increase up to four milligrams. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, so our feeling was that Prior to obviously her Cushing syndrome, she had an intact pituitary gland and an intact right contralateral adrenal gland. And having, see, with the diagnosis of Cushing syndrome, she suppressed her pituitary corticotrophs and actually giving even adequate um, replacement dose of prednisolone would continue to suppress her pituitary corticotrophs further. So our feeling was we would reduce her dose down to two milligrams. Um, and the way we went about doing this was using we call the Imperial Mirin Protocol. Um, I've just shown week zero to 18 here, but it's a 24 week weaning protocol that in the first four weeks um, goes down from five to a physiological dose of three milligrams um, and then one milligram every seven weeks. Um, and it was initially used by, it is used by the Vasculitis Forum for patients who are weaning um, adnisolone for an in inflammatory autoimmune condition. Um, and we, we've been using this for different patient cohorts, including our patients with Cushing syndrome and disease who are weaning off the corticoid therapy. And it's not completely prescriptive. Some patients feel a bit more rotten on, you know, a certain dose. For example, this lady, um, this patient um, stayed on two milligrams for a little longer um, before she felt ready to wean down to one milligram. So when she was on two milligrams, we then repeated the prednisolone day curve. Um, and I'll pop the results from the three milligrams next to it. So you can see she was being under replaced on two milligrams, her eight, eight hour level, which is what we commonly, what we commonly use um, to guide dosing is slightly less than our reference. 
And while we were weaning her, she underwent careful clinical monitoring, depending on how her symptoms were doing. I mentioned she stayed on two milligrams for slightly longer um, than the protocol advised. Um, and she underwent regular SSTs along with ACTH um, levels as well. And these are her SSTs on her different, um, as she weaned down. So on 30 milligrams, she has a very flat SST and note her ACTH of 78. When she reduced down to two milligrams, there was some improvement in her, in her cortisol levels, but again, remained pretty flat. On repeating it two months later, still on two milligrams, there's evidence that her pituitary corticotrophs are doing something. Her ACTH is 130 um, and her cortisol levels, although not optimal, are better than they were um, two months prior. And of note, um, she emailed Prof and say she felt better when she was on one milligram as she was weaning down. And these were her results on one milligram, showing evidence of recovery. And these are just the results in the table form. You can see that the cortisol um, levels on the FFT results are improving as she leans down. And it's working from her APTH on the far right hand side um, with evidence that she, she's got some HPA access recovery. In terms of what's going on in Cushing syndrome, so you have a um, uh, adrenal adenoma um, producing cortisol, which causes pituitary corticotrophic suppression. This means you have zero ACTH leading to the atrophy of the contralateral adrenal gland. As a result, patients require um, exogenous glucocorticoid replacement therapy, so either hydrocortisone or prednisolone. I should add, probably not the doses um, given here. Um, however, giving excess glucocorticoid further suppresses the pituitary corticotrophs leading to zero ACTH. So if we can minimize the dose by slowly weaning glucocorticoid replacement, we can allow for some ACTH recovery. And as a result of that, um, the recovery of the HP axis and um, endogenous cortisol production, which reduces the need for, for glucocorticoid replacement therapy long-term. The discussion points. There's no real clear consensus about how we should wean uh, steroids. Um, we are feeling at Imperial is that um, you obviously need to give replacement um, while there's evidence of a suppressed um, or atrophied contralateral adrenal gland. Um, and our feeling is by underrunning patients, we can stimulate the pituitary corticotrophs to allow for ACTH recovery. There's also a challenge as patients wean um, in terms of distinguishing between glucocorticoid withdrawal therapy, uh, withdrawal um, versus adrenal insufficiency. Often the symptoms of, sort of fatigue and uh, foggy headedness are very similar. And especially in Cushing syndrome, where patients are used to much higher levels of, of cortisol. Um, and really just, although we're advocating weaning, there's a real need for close monitoring, um, both clinically and biochemically, um, to ensure patients remain well and <laughs> um, HPA access recovery before you completely stop. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you so much, Kate. Um, I'm gonna jump in with one quick question. Um, which I hesitate to say in the home of prednisolone, but um, could there be an argument that if you use hydrocortisone for its shorter half-life, when you know that there will be times of day when the levels will be extremely low, then you're going to challenge your access better in terms of recovery? Possibly. We just don't have the evidence as to which is better. Um, our experiences with prednisolone, and because we have the levels we use to sort of optimise dosing, and, and we can see whether we're underrunning patients, our experience is using prednisolone, and it has the advantage it's once a day for patients. Um, but other centres use hydrocortisone. There really is no right or wrong answer. I'm, I'm saying what we do clinically here. Prof. <laughs> I mean, yes, hydrocortisone, well, the problem is we give it three times a day. So we, we need to stop doing that. And if we if we don't give it, if we give it three times a day, people, we have a lot of patients, in fact, who are on three to hydrocortisone in this group who are on hydrocortisone for 20 years who shouldn't be uh, because we don't try. And that's because we believe they, they need it. But that third dose causes persistent suppression. So you're right. If we can use it once daily or twice daily, then it yeah. would work. But but we don't because we worry they'll have a crisis. And they might not. Thank you. Uh, congratulations. Lovely presentation. Very clear. Um, 
at the risk of displaying not only my ignorance, but also offending Kareem. <laughs> why, it all seems very wizardry in, in doing the SST. <laughs> why, why don't you just measure the ACTH more often? Just finally, you showed it at the end. You know, we do TSH and T4 for thyroid. Why don't you do the ACTH all the time? I mean, that... that... <laughs> um, there's a lot of variation in terms of ACTH, so it's quite difficult to interpret an ACTH value on its own, not seeing the cortisol. Um, I think that would be the worry. And in someone who has Addison's disease, for example, which is sort of an autoimmune destruction of the adrenal glands, you can have no cortisol and a very high ACTH the pituitary gland is trying to stimulate the adrenal gland. So you, you have a, um, an intact pituitary gland and you have an in previously intact adrenal gland, which, again, you know, the SSTs we were having a chat the other day, that the SSTs look very similar when they're flat as to someone with Addison's. But in someone who has was previously well, our feeling is we can try and stimulate. But, but we don't know whether, you know, groups of patients who aren't able to wean. Um, uh, I think, David, you're a prophet. I think in 10 years from now, we'll be doing fewer synaptin tests and more ACTH. I think that is quite likely. But you need to get us all off synaptin tests because we're completely hooked on them. I just thought I'd ask because I think some people may be think, wondering this as well, is what's your view on when you still cover for sick day rules, which has been that sort of sitting on the fence point? Um, um We'd still advise patients to cover for sick day rules until they're fully weaned off. Because um, it's a pretty high ACTH, isn't it? So if they had another insult on top of that, that might be a concern. No, we, we would still advise until patients are off. And there's, I guess, variation in practice in terms of advising for just sick day dosing, even if someone's not on it, uh, not on any replacement. We, we don't really have the evidence um, for patients who are fully weaned off and whether they need sort of a sick day cover. Um, Brilliant. So I think we should probably move on so we have a sporting chance to finish. But thank you, Kate. That was an absolutely great presentation. Very Okay, so for the last presentation today, and certainly not least, so we have Dr. Vivek Ramburat from Peterborough City Hospital. will talk to us about a case of multidisciplinary man management of multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Vivek, I'm one of the IMT3 at Peterborough City Hospital. Thank you for this opportunity to present this case of MEN1 that uh, came to our District General Hospital over the last year. Our story is about a 38-year-old gentleman with recurrent episodes of urinary tract stones. His first episode of renal colic started at the age of 22 back in 2005 in Lithuania, since then, he's been in and out of hospital with recurrent attacks of um, renal colic. In December last year, he first presents to our hospital, again with renal colic. A CT KUB is done that shows extensive bilateral nephrocalcinosis. Um, initial blood investigations um, indicates uh, raised calcium, low phosphate, a markedly raised PTH at 199 uh, picomoles per litre, raised ALP and normal vitamin D levels a picture consistent most likely with primary hypoaldosteronism. At that stage, he's, he gets referred to our endocrinology department, and given his um, age and um, primary, probable primary hyperparathyroidism, MEN1 is suspected and genetic testing is requested. Unfortunately, after 48 hours, he self-discharges and no interventions are done at that stage. We do manage to bring him back two weeks later for an outpatient ultrasound of his neck that shows a 23 uh, millimeter nodule in the left lower lobe of the thyroid gland. A MIDI scan shows focal uptake in the left um, lower lobe of the thyroid. He comes back two weeks later, again with severe renal colic, ongoing vomiting for four days, severe dehydration and AKI. His bloods show a markedly raised calcium of 4.22, ETH of 189, um, and a GFO of 34. Um, as you can see on the CTKUB, that was repeated. He's got uh, bilateral nephrocalcinosis and a large stone in his urinary bladder. He started on IV fluids, three to four liters daily, um, intravenous bisphosphonates and sinicalcet, 30 milligrams, three times a day. However, um, he remains treatment refractory and his hypercalcemia persists. My first question to the audience is, how would you manage uh, this patient with refractory hypercalcemia? 
would you advise continuing fluids and bisphosphonates? Would you uh, increase the dose of cynic acid? Would you give dinozumab? Or would you advise uh, parathyroidectomy? Thank you. Uh, most of you guys would go for parathyroidectomy, which is what uh, we decided in this patient. Okay, so uh, intraoperatively, however, the um, uh, left lower parathyroid was firmly adherent to the thyroid tissue, and our ENT surgeon in our DGS could not dissect the, um, uh, the parathyroid from the thyroid glands. So he ends up with a left hemi-thyroidectomy uh, and a two-gland parathyroidectomy. Most operatively, his calcium levels normalize quickly, down to 2.43 millimoles per liter, and his PTH drops by 80%, down to 43 picomoles per liter, and his GFR improves to 55. Subsequent histology shows of the two parathyroid gland shows um, multi-glandular parathyroid adenomas. He's noted to have um, a left um, vocal cord palsy postoperatively um, on direct visualization. The following month, his genetic tests come back and that shows mutation in the MEN1 gene. At that stage, we then start investigating for MEN1-associated tumors. A fasting gut hormone profile is done that shows elevated gastrin levels and chromogranin A levels. His pituitary hormone profile is, however, normal. Four weeks later, um, imaging investigations are completed. A multiphase CT shows um, presence of a 14 millimeter lesion in the tail of the pancreas as well as multiple um, lytic lesions in the iliac crest and the um, thoracic um, spine. MRI pituitary is, however, normal. He's then referred to um, NET and um, MTT in um, Cambridge. Um, so my second question to the audience is, how would you manage the pancreatic lesion? Would you advise surgery? Would you advise endoscopic ultrasound, FNA, plus minus ablation? Would you advise medical therapy with oxyotide PPIs? Or would you advise watchful waiting? Most of you would go for surgery. Uh, in this uh, patient, um, decision was made to go for um, AUS or endoscopic ultrasound, um, IDs, which is done three months later in Leicester, uh, where a 10 millimeter pancreatic um, tail lesion is confirmed endoscopically. FNA um, samples are taken and ablation is also done. Subsequently, cytology, however, is negative for malignant cells. Um, in the same month, he gets seen by the clinical genetics team and um, receives extensive counseling um, um, and genetic screening is offered to his relatives in the UK. Uh, he's then rediscussed in September. He's now back to our hospital. He's planned for a uh, repeat um, EUS um, in a few weeks' time, and is now on, on an MEN1 surveillance program. To conclude, um, we presented a case of multiple endocrine neopedia type 1 that we saw in our district general hospital with confirmed um, mutation in the MEN1 gene with features of multiglandular parathyroid adenoma that led to severe hypercalcemia, recurrent kidney stones, chronic kidney disease and lytic bone lesions that was treated with a two-gland uh, parathyroidectomy, also with a probable pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor that was ablated, who is now on a surveillance program. To conclude, several specialties um, were involved um, in the care of these patients. Um, this case highlights the difficulties and the challenges in managing such patients, uh, particularly when working in the district, um, district general hospital settings. Um, this wide team across both secondary and tertiary level were involved and will continue to be involved um, in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a very clear presentation of a complex case. Thank you very much for this nice uh, uh, description of an intriguing case, really. Um, uh, the pancreatic lesion, uh, I wonder about a little bit. Uh, there was no other scan rather than the endoscopic ultrasound. Of, uh, no, I like was aware. Tide, sorry. Was, we just did a CT and uh, endoscopic okay. ultrasound. There was no other imaging we'd done. Okay. Because um, uh, gastrin pro producing 
neuroendocrine pancreatic tumor is usually not that detailed. That's unusual. So it's probably not uh, the cause of hypergastrinemia. And um, radioablation, that's fine, but it's quite experimental on MEN1 patients, I would, <laughs> I would advocate. Uh, we don't know the long, uh, what happens in the long run, I suppose. And one centimeter doesn't need treatment at all. That can be discussed. Thank you. Should be discussed. So thank you very much. Very nice. And I, I agree with Professor Zadinia. So I'm sure you haven't treated the source of his gastrin. Um, it's likely he's got multiple small tumors in his pancreas. So I don't really see the logic of treating one and it's less than two centimeters, so we would just observe. So uh, I'm not sure you've done any harm, but I'm not sure that they've done any good either. Um, and I think we would probably do a dotatate to uh, see where we were and survey him and do a more definitive MEN1 pancreas operation later on if needed. I may add, so if this patient's uh, MTT, the initial decision was for an endoscopic ultrasound. However, I'm not sure why the decision was made for to ablate in um, subsequently, uh, but uh, it was the outcome of this patient. No, this is why this, I think this is exactly why it's helpful to discuss these difficult cases in here. And your team took advice from the Cambridge Net team. So, you know, this is the respectful conversation about difficult cases. No, needless to say, unfortunately, in addition to the other little issues, he's not cured of hyperparathyroidism. And he now has a, a very difficult problem, which is having persistence, which will, it may be normal calcemic persistence, but the PTH was 43 post-op, so that's pretty fruity. But he's got a vocal cord palsy. So when he has the reoperation, you, you know, there's a significant risk for him. It's a, it sort of goes back to... What James was saying previously that the 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 risk is low of having permanent vocal loss of voice per permanent loss of voice with tracheostomy that risk is low, but the stakes are very high. Okay, thank you very much you. for your presentation. Well done. It should be really Kareem that closes this meeting and opens this meeting because. Without him, this whole thing wouldn't happen. So I take the credit, but it's actually his and originally Steve Blooms because he supported this and Wardrick Dillo who can't be with us today. I'd like to thank all of you here today and 122 people online. If you, you, if you want, you can actually unmute and applaud yourselves. Now we'll find out <laughs> whether you're actually here. We can hear them. There's one person.